All righty. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. Say hi to me in the chat. Tell me where you're joining from. We are now streaming live to Facebook as well. So hello to everyone on Facebook. There's still time to invite somebody you know that should be here who is not here. So when they're asking you all those questions, you'll be like, well, you should have attended the webinars. You would have heard all these things about your skin. So invite them now. And I'll just go ahead. Well, it's 4.31, I'll go ahead. So I'm Flora. I am the founder of Encapsulate Healthcare Solutions. I, found, I founded the organization to empower us as a people with the right information regarding our health so that we can make the right decisions about our health, the health of our family, our friends, our colleagues, whoever we come across. Okay? So I don't want to spend too long on myself because I want us to get into it. The experts are ready with loads of information for you. All right, so I'm going to go straight to our first speaker. Now, uh, our first speaker is Dr. Irere Otroff. Now, I'm shortening her surname because I don't want to get in trouble. So, <laughs> her name is Dr. Irere Otroff. She's a consultant dermatologist and genitourinary specialist. She's a senior lecturer at the College of Medicine, University of Lagos, and, and Luz. She's an international fellow of the American Association of Dermatologists and fellow of the Postgraduate Medical College of Nigeria in internal medicine. She's, she's the current treasurer of the Nigerian Association of Dermatologists. Erere, the floor is yours. Go for it. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we okay. can. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you, Flora, for um, introducing me and making my head swell. <laughs> Only today. Okay, fine. That's all right. You want me to share my screen? Yes, please. Have I not allowed you? Not yet. Okay, should we be able to do it now? Okay, hold on. I don't know what has happened. So while Eri is trained her screen, say hello to me in the chat and tell me where you're joining from. Okay. Remember to invite other people. All right, you're all good? Just a minute. All right. Okay. All right. Okay, okay. So um, if you don't... Can you see my screen? Hello? Yes, I, yes can I can see it. Yeah. Okay. Just a minute. All right, everybody. Without wasting much ado, we know how many minutes do I have for this? <clears throat> we talked about this. <laughs> Ten. <laughs> Don't try it again. I'll, I'll try. Okay, so I'm just going to be giving all of us an overview of the skin. I'm just going to just like to set the ground in a manner of speaking. Um, thank you to Encapsulate Health and all the other co-founders, and thank you to my co-speakers. I'll be very interested in hearing what you all have to say shortly. So, without um, further ado, okay, somebody needs to, because as a co-host, I, I, my screen is freezing because I'm having to admit other people. I don't know how. Can you do something about that, Flora? So what is this thing called skin that we keep talking about when we say skin? So, I mean, hopefully in the next like eight minutes, I hope to do it in less than 10. I just could give you an overview of the basic structure of the skin and give you functions of the skin and just talk about steps of having a healthy skin if we can. So you can see this young man here with all the nice melanin popping, looking very neat, very clean. Everything is very even. Mm. Light is scattering off the face at the right angle. It looks like oh, yes. absolutely no problem. So he looks like <laughs> he's got all the money. We will wish to be like this, won't we? All the time, not just sometimes. So just to quickly say that the skin is the largest organ of the body and it's um, primarily made up of the epidermis, the dermis, and the subcutaneous tissue. And it covers about maybe two square meters of the body's total surface area which is really large when you think about it. And that's why we say it's the largest organ. And it is the main barrier between yourself and the outside world. And if you think about it, when you actually take off the skin, if you like stripped off the skin in its entirety, it's huge. And it's uh, supposed to actually like clear and cover the surface of a medium-sized container. That's weird. I'm hoping nobody can do like face-off 
and take this off and look like just a skeleton that we see in that picture. So the basic skin structure is what we see on the screen. And it's made of the epidermis, like I said. I don't know if you can see the pointer. Can you see my pointer? The epidermis, the dermis, and then the hypodermis. Yes. And in the in the epidermis, we have about four or five layers, depending on what part of the skin we're talking about. I won't go too much in town. And the uh, epidermis actually houses the hair follicle, but it is vaginated into the dermis. So the hair is actually an epidermal structure, but it's sitting within the dermis because that's where it's supposed to get all its nourishment. The hair and the nails and the mucous membranes are appendages of the skin, so they're all part of the skin. And the hypodermis, so the dermis houses uh, the blood vessels, the nerves, everything that keeps the skin alive, as it were, is in the dermis. And then the hypodermis is also the subcutaneous tissue. It houses your fat cells and gives you all that plush and connective tissue um, that we want. Now, in talking about the functions of the epidermis, which we say is the outermost layer of the skin, it it protects the dermis, which we know that we've said it has all the nerves and the sweat glands and the oil glands, and it's effective to prevent water loss. The average skin with all these hair follicles is, a, is like a reservoir for water, water from the internal parts of the body. So the epidermis is there so that you're not losing too much water and become extremely dehydrated. The epidermis also houses the skin associated lymphoid tissue, which are like your police, you know, the ones that take care of infections and stuff like that. And it helps to produce vitamin D as it is the barrier against infection. And it contains the melanocytes inside your cells for pigmentation. And of course, it has an aesthetic function because your epidermis is the outermost part. It's what people see. It's what makes you attractive to talk with. It's what makes somebody wants to talk to you. It's what makes somebody wants to sit in the train or the bus next to you or like, oh, I'm not going that way. So it does have an aesthetic function as well. I had mentioned that the uh, pigmentation of your skin is housed in the epidermis, in the basal layer of the skin. So that's like the lowermost part of the epidermis. So you can see where my pointer is. And all these tiny, tiny, tiny black things are literally the melanin that is supposed to be touching all the other major cells of the skin, like your keratinocytes, okay? But the major cells of the skin are the uh, keratinocytes and then the melanocytes via the hormone tyrosinase will be producing melanin. Melanin is extremely important to the skin and all its other functions. Now, the adnexial structure, we talk about skin and its adnexial structure is appended to the hair follicles, the sweat glands. They are uh, in the dermis, like I said. So as the epidermis is like the thin skin, so if you take it off a little bit, you now find all this papillary dermis and going into the dermis. Now, the importance of this, where you have your sweat glands, your sebaceous glands, your nerves, your blood cells, are that Whatever it is that you put on the epidermis, because it's a thin skin, it actually really, really nicely goes down into the dermis with this rich network of capillaries, that's the blood vessels, thin blood vessels, and it goes deeper into the entire body. So once you don't think of them as separate things, but all together. The sweat glands are found everywhere. We have acrine and apocrine sweat glands. They are found everywhere, excluding your mucous membranes, which are your lips, and around the vagina or the phallus, that's your um, the sex um, organ, so to speak. They vary with site to site concentration, and their highest concentration, that's the acrine sweat glands, are on the palms and the soles of the feet, and they're supplied by the nerves, the sympathetic cholinergic nerves, so that when you are afraid, they are more stimulated and you tend to sweat a lot. Now, sweat varies from person to person, site to site, day to day, or mostly it is containing sodium and chloride, like salt, so it tastes very salty. And in certain situations, like maybe you're taking some medication, it is secreted in sweat. So you can actually use it in forensic. I mean, the forensic people can use your sweat to check whether you're the one who had arsenic poisoning or you've had garlic and you say you didn't, telling me a lie or two. The apocrine glands of the sweat, uh, the apocrine sweat glands, on the other hand, are part of the hair unit where we talk about the pilot sebaceous. And they are found in the axilla, in the perianal, like around the um, anus, around the vagina, around the areola. And their activity is androgen dependent. So the they generally have, a, have an odor only when they have been acted upon by bacteria. The, they, but they generally have a slightly more odor secretion than the equine sweat glands do. So what makes sweat stink, as it were, is the sweat itself with bacteria that you see on your skin and when there's uh, oxygen, you know, so it acts and then you tend to smell, as it were, so they stink. And that's what I've just uh, depicted over there. The sebaceous glands are extremely important. They are found in the midline of the back, on the T-zone of the face, on the forehead, around the, um, the air, the um, air canal. 
they they produce sebum, which is a very important moisturizer. It's your natural moisturizer. When we talk about natural moisturizing factor, we actually mean how how rich your sebaceous glands are actually effective and what they're doing. And they prevent water loss. Remember that oil and water do not really mix. So when you have sebum in your body, it prevents extreme water loss from the epidermis. So you see, it's all part of the protective function of the skin. And you have um, on its own, the, the sebum that is being produced has fungi and bacteriostatic properties, which means they will allow fungi there, but they will not allow it to thrive. So we don't want to really lose all our sebum. People who say they're too oily and they want to dry, we have to have that at the back of our mind. I talked about the blood supply that is rich in capillary, and then it's also important for temperature control. When you're very cold, your blood uh, vessels dilate so that you can actually um, generate heat. Uh, and when you're, sorry, they constrict so that you don't lose too much. And then when you're hot, it dilates so that you can actually evaporate, you don't give up. Your nutrition is also part of the enriching of the blood supply, because that's where you get your oxygen, and uh, your tissues extract oxygen from your blood vessels. Dr. Irere? Yes, yeah. They would Almost like done. you to go. They would no. They would like you to go slower. Oh, I'm please. sorry. Okay, I'm looking Thank at my you. time. Um, so the hypodermis, which is the subcutaneous tissue, we call subcutaneous, is that connective tissue. You know that layer above the muscle and beneath the dermis, which gives you that contour and shape, as it were, especially where women are concerned, because it's rich with uh, fat cells. Now it provides thermal insulation and mechanical protection. So it gives you the buffer. So you see, if you look at this picture where you have these nice little women, if she falls down, she's probably going to have all the pain involved because there's not enough protection, a mechanical protection compared to the lady to the extreme right there. It also gives smoothness and contour to our body. And then the, remember that the adipose swell fat cells generally a high source of thermal energy. So people who, are, who have more adipose tissues tend to not be as cold in the normal circumstances compared to those sort of things. But you know that people are very different. And it's also important to realize that the um, subcutaneous layer is actually where you give injections. When they, when they tell you they want to give you an injection, you can go into the muscle, but for the most part, you will take subcutaneous, so you pinch it and you have the adipose tissue. Now these, these vary in size, depending on what part of the body it is that we're talking about. Now the hair and the nails, uh, skin appendages and they vary they vary across continents they vary across the um, across the geographical locations but they're all part of this so usually whatever happens to your skin if you give it enough time it will happen to your hair if you give it even more time it will happen to your nails though the nails are I mean, what you see on the nail the outer part, outer part of the nail is actually the dead skin you know like the end of it all and so when you think in terms of diseases of the nails or diseases of the hair, you usually would want to do something that is going through the bloodstream because it doesn't have as much, um, uh, I mean, live nucleus or things uh, that's supposed to actually take the blood. It's not really seen on them. So you have to have a prolonged treatment to take care of a nail or a hair disorder. And so time, most times most time we do both topical and systemic um, treatment for the appendages. So I'm hoping that I have done 10 minutes or less because if I want to just summarize the function, I'll say that the skin is like a waterproof, you know, wrapping for our entire body. I mean, think about a house that doesn't have walls, so as it were. Of course, all the elements are in there. So it's the first line of defense against bacteria and other organisms. And it's a cooling system via sweat. And it's a sense organ that gives us information about pain, pressure, temperature, and pressure. And if we take good care of our skin, we tend to we enjoy the skin. And so I would just segue into skin care steps, talking in terms of that for the most part is to wash and cleanse your skin, is to moisturize it, is to have adequate sun protection, and is to have a healthy diet. If we look at all of this, simplistically speaking, that's all you really need in taking care of your skin so that it can do all those functions I have spoken to you about. Wash your skin generally, moisturize that's important a lot of men i think is against their profession and their religion to moisturize but i'm not saying anything yet i'm not castigating anybody i'm just saying adequately sun protect sun avoid and then you eat right a healthy diet is not about fancy food it's about all the nutrients in the right quantity in the right quality and so what do we mean by washing and cleansing we want you to use a simple gentle cleanser which has friendly skin ph that means it should be slightly acidic, looking for an oil. 
It shouldn't be degreasing. We want to keep your sebum. Should you be using hot or cold water? Preferably cooler water than hot water because remember I talked about heat expanding the vessels and making you lose even more water. Do you need to sponge? Not particularly, but some people swear by sponges. And then what do we mean by moisturizing? And why should we moisturize? Because it helps rehydrate the skin. Remember that you've just had the wash, you lose water. If you moisturize, you trap the water. It makes your skin look better when it's moistened than when it is dry. And it keeps the integrity of the skin so that it can do its function even better. Sun protection. This is extremely important when you think about the fact that the ultraviolet A, B, and C can penetrate almost all the way to the skin, that is UVA and B. UVC is still in the ozone layer, but UVA goes all the way down to the dermis. UVB goes just above the epidermis, just beneath the epidermis. And how do we sun protect? Either you avoid the sun if you are so blessed that you work from home. Avoid the sun even inside your house. Don't stay near the windows because the sun will actually go to UVA, goes through glass. Or you sun protect if you must be in the sun. You wear hats, you wear sunglasses, you keep a UV protective umbrella, they are UV penetrated umbrellas. And then you use sunscreens or sun lotion and sun creams, that's the case to me. Usually of SPF at least 50 with a protection, uh, UVA protection factor of at least two pluses. And that's what you see here, PA double plus. Nutrition, when we talk about nutrition, we're talking about the balanced diet with lots of water, rich in antioxidants, because everything we do in life right now is filled with pollutants. And so we need to cancel out the free radicals. And that's usually with the high dose vitamin E, vitamin C, and a lot of all the other trace elements. You need to take vitamin supplements. If you know you're not getting rich enough food, by all means do that. If your vegetables are not nice and green like this, by all means add supplements. If you're in an area where you don't trust the kind of vegetables or fruits that you get, by all means, you supplement. So in conclusion, I've just talked to you a little bit, giving an overview of the skin. And I will conclude by saying that if you care for your skin appropriately, it's very rewarding because a clean and moisturized and well-nourished skin, which is sun-protected, is often healthy and shines with a glow. So you don't have to go get a glow cream to help your shine. Thank you for listening to me. I hope I have done less of it to Thank you. Yes, you kind of did stick to your time-ish. <laughs> well, okay, we have quite a few questions coming in for you now. Um, I am going to ask those who have put their questions in the chat. Thank you very much for that. Um, I will call you and you raise your hand because we like this to be interactive. Coco, could you unmute yourself and ask your question? Or raise your hand so I can find you so then I can ask you to unmute and then you can ask your question. All right, there she is. Okay, go Hi, ahead. Everybody, thank you for um, inviting me and letting me be part of this. Um, I'm just asking um, more about baby skin because um, I have my little nephews who are having some issues with um, maybe, I wouldn't call it eczema, but just some kind of irritated skin. Uh, especially now with the heat that we've been having, they've been having some heat rush. So I just wanted some advice on how to look after baby skin. If that could be, is that, you know, because sometimes I feel like we, we look after baby skin like we look after our own, and I feel that's a bit harsh. So I wanted to see if there's anything you could give in, a, in terms of advice on looking after baby skin, please. Okay. Thank you very much, Coco. Um, Flora, can I go ahead and answer that question? Right. So, um, yeah, thank you for the question. So, yes, you are very correct in saying that baby skin is not like our skin. When I say our, we mean the adults, and you should be a bit more careful. However, technically speaking, what you do to your baby is what you should do to yourself. So I think it's actually the reverse. If we're not taking good care of our baby skin, the chances are we're not doing the right thing for ourselves. It's still the same sort of thing. You want to use gentle skin cleansers. You don't want to wash your baby skin a little too often. And when I say wash, wash with soap. But you also want to hydrate them as much as possible. So the skincare is such that you want to use not hot water, but tepid. And you can't probably uh, calm it down because you don't want them to evaporate. Remember that they have a larger surface area to their side. So they will really evaporate if you um, bake them with hot water, which people tend to do. You want it to be cooler than hot. And even if you want to start with the warm water, you can make the bath cool so that it kind of plays. 
You also want to moisturize when their skin is still damp. Sorry, let me just go back to the wash. When you're having the wash, preferably use what we call syndet, synthetic detergent, as opposed to soap, because soap, very foamy, becomes very dry. So synthetic detergents, uh, I mean, I, I can't give a trade name now because I'm not, um, I'm not speaking for any company as it were, but you want things that are not too foamy and you don't want to wash them more than once a day because really, what are they doing? They're not going anywhere. They're not getting dirty. They're not, you know, so you want to wash them with soap less than you want to. So you, you can hydrate them. You can, you can encourage um, maybe like little pool shower. You can spray them down with water. We should always moisturize the skin um, when the skin is still a bit damp so that you are trapping moisture as opposed to trapping or uh, dryness. Most people use an oil and the skin is dry. So the skin just shines. It's not well moisturized. Then you also want to, for babies, you also want to wear the very cool, lightweight clothing. You don't want them to be too tight. You don't want them too covered. I don't know if that helps. You don't want to use fragrance, you know, things like that. I'm not sure. If, if Coco, is that is that good enough for you? Uh, yes, that's fine. That's fine. I, what about um, the, um, I think you mentioned not using a sponge on adults. Um, even yeah, on children, sure. even on children. So the thing about sponging is that you tend to start to scratch. <laughs> you, you tend to start to scratch because you become a little bit too harsh on your skin. You can use a loofah, you can use maybe like a face flannel, but sometimes I tell patients to use a face flannel and then you see what they're doing. They make the face flannel really hard and they're you know, using a lot of energy in trying to scrub. And so it's like you're going back to use a scrubber as it were. You want to be gentle on baby skin because you don't want friction. You don't want a lot of tension and cause abrasion, you know. Sometimes people use a sponge because they want to like um, improve how much the soap that they want the soap to go a long way because the soap is like almost finished or something so you just want to be careful how it is you're using if you want to wash out your axilla that's the armpits and then the bottom area that's fine you know you can use the sponge but generally it's really not necessary this soap is enough to do the cleansing and the degreasing that you are looking for during a shower or a bath all right coco I, I, is that okay i think she's answered both questions all right, so somebody, iPhone, you've got your hand raised. I don't know your name, so ask your question. iPhone, are you there? Right, okay, let me take one more question in chat before we move on. We will get to all your questions, even if we don't do them now. We're still going to have a Q&A at the end. So let me just take the next question that's in the chat. Um, from JM, do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, please? Or oh, raise your hand and I can find you. JM? Oh, you don't want to speak. Oh, I found you. So ask your question. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my question was just born out of curiosity. I, I believe um, Dr. mentioned that. Uh, our nails and hair are an appendage, they're a part of our skin. And I know our hair and nails keep growing all through, through our lives. But if they are dead cells or they're dead skin, why do they keep growing? And I also realized that uh, even when the body decomposes, uh, the hair and um, nails don't seem to decompose. So what are they made of? And why, why do they, why, why, why are they like this? Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, I didn't get the name Jay. I don't remember what you said the name was. So thank you for that. Yeah. So maybe oh, okay. So maybe we did you didn't quite hear me. So I was saying that the top, that's the nail plate itself, is the one that is dead. The nail is a living organ, but the nail plate itself is the one that is dead cells, so to speak. Mm. It's like very hard keratin. So it's equivalent oh. to your epidermis. That's the stratum corneum, the very top layer of your skin, which is doesn't have a nucleus. So it's waiting to fall off. But the nail is alive. The nail bed, everything, blood vessels, oh. everything goes through that. So I, maybe you didn't, maybe I spoke too fast. Okay. Yes. Maybe. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> no problem. Okay. All right. The rest of the questions we'll take during the q and I'm conscious of the time. I don't want us to be run too over. So we'll go straight to the next speaker. Now, before I do that, I have a quiz for the audience. So... What are your thoughts about skin health? What do you think skin health is? 
let me remove the doctor so she's not allowed to answer. Who wants to have a go at what skin healthy? Just raise your hand and let me know. Pop it in the chat. All right. Go ahead. Uh, is that when it? Yes. Hello. Yes. What is skin health? It's when it Morris. Go ahead. What do you think skin health is? You're breaking up. I can't hear you anymore. I don't know if anybody can hear my voice. Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. What is? What do you think skin health is? Okay, I believe skincare is, you know, um, looking after your skin right from when you have your bath you know, your normal daily routine of skincare. I mean, just looking after your skin, moisturizing, washing, moisturizing, and nutrition, healthy nutrition, it affects your skin and uh, generally protecting yourself as well. Everything combined together is skincare as far as I'm concerned. Thank you for that. So just hold that thought and we'll see whether most of what you said, the expert, the dermatologist will agree. Thank you for that. Does one more person want to give me their thoughts on what they think skin health is? Oh my goodness, Before... I can't hear you at all. I can't hear you. Does anyone else want to give their thoughts? No, professionals are not allowed. No, you're not allowed. Just the audience, non-professionals only. Okay, Bisala is saying skin health is intact skin that is well perfused. What is perfused, Bisala? Perfused with what? Perfume? Oil? Put, put your hand up so that you can explain to us that I can find you. What does perfused mean? Okay, Oluashe, you said skin health involves using topical products and also supplements to take care of good care of your skin and keep it healthy. It also involves things like eating healthy meals and changing your beddings. Ah, well done. Let's see what the experts say if they agree. All right, Bisola, what were you saying? What are you perfusing? So what I meant by that is, you know, good blood flow. So you have the right skin color, right skin texture. You know, if you were to um, press on it, it will spring back within the expected length, you know, just glowing. Ah, so Bisola, are you a healthcare professional? I'm a pharmacist. You, you are not allowed to answer now. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> All right, no problem. Anyway, thank you for your contribution. All right, so let me bring on our... Our other expert, her name is Dr. Ifoma Abadjue. She's a dermatologist and also an esthetician. She has over 15 years experience in the sector. After her medical degree, she specialized in family medicine. Then she went on to ob obtain a diploma in practical dermatology from the University of Wales, and then another diploma in advanced aesthetic training from the University of South Wales. She also has a diploma from the American Board of Aesthetic Medicine. She has distinguished herself in the aesthetic sector and is one of the founder of the Aesthetic Clinic, the foremost aesthetic practice in Nigeria, where they have on-trend customized treatments and cutting edge advancements. Dr. Ifoma, where art thou? I saw you just now, but I can't see you again. So I can spotlight you. Where's she gone? Oh, there we go. And we can just have you put on your video and a spotlight. Can you see me? Uh, I can't at the moment. We did before. But you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Well, my video is on, so I don't know why it would. OK, just try and share your screen and let's see whether that would help. OK. Yes, there Thank we go. You. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Hello, All everyone. Right. I'm happy to be here. This has been a very enlightening conversation. Eri has shared everything, like she covered everything. <laughs> Even if we were to go home now, I believe we've learned a lot already. And um, I like the fact that she went very technical because people tend to underestimate the fact that the skin is an organ and should be respected. And they tend to see it, oh, it's just skin, but looking at the science of it, you can see that it's not just skin. It's a complex organ. 
with layers that have functions. And um, the fact that she went through all the functions uh, was very useful. So now we understand that the skin is a major organ. We should, um, and how we take care of it matters. What we put on top of it matters. Um, can you see my screen? I'm trying to share. You can see it? Yes, I can. Yes, so, Just sorry, my slides, my slides are not as advanced as hers. <laughs> it's fine. So like Ibido said, um, I'm an aesthetic dermatologist. I focus more on aesthetics and our practice, our practice is based on more on aesthetics than on skin diseases. And because of that, we see more issues that have to do with um, what the skin looks like rather than skin diseases. And I like the, the, the two people you asked about what skin health is. I think they were on point. I liked what someone said. Someone said it's, it's holistically caring for your body and your skin. And I like that answer. And it's really quite simple. Skin health, healthy skin, I think they're interchangeable. I'm trying to time myself, sorry. <laughs> okay, so I think they're interchangeable. Eri already mentioned that skin is the largest organ in your body with protective sensory and regulatory functions. Now, what, what does healthy skin look like? Just to show you. So this is this really is what healthy skin looks like. No, sorry, Dr. Ifoma, put it on slideshow so that the picture will be bigger, slightly smaller at the moment. Uh, Just right at the bottom, right at the bottom. Uh, keep going, right. keep going, stop, no, yeah. no, to the left, yeah. right in the middle, keep going to your left, oh, no, yeah. One. yeah, that one, yeah, okay, Great. yeah, so this basically is what healthy skin looks like, you can see it's evenly complexioned, it's not too dry, it's not too oily, um, it looks supple, um, it, there, there are no breakouts, minim, no wrinkles or minimal wrinkles, so to speak. Yeah, so that really is what healthy skin looks like. And it's very simple. You don't, um, you, you don't need to do much. So one thing I find with aesthetics is that when people come to us, they've bought zillions of products already, online, offline, everywhere. They come with, they really come with bags of products. And having healthy skin is not necessarily related to using so many products. They go online and they hear all sorts of influencers saying, oh, niacinamide today, this, that, it's ascorbic acid today, it's this, and they buy a lot of products. Having healthy skin doesn't necessarily mean you have to use a lot of products. It doesn't mean you have to use expensive products. So that's always the first thing I notice when people come. And Eri mentioned the basic things you have to do for skin health. It's really to clean your skin, cleanse, what we call cleanse, which means to wash your skin, to remove all the dirt, oils, and all that. And then the next thing I like to exfoliate, she didn't mention it, and it's kind of like a bit advanced, but at the same time, it's still something basic you can do. And that is to help remove the dead skin on the surface. Because remember that our skin has a cycle of about 28 days and sometimes the dead skin sticks to your skin. So you want to help to remove it. So exfoliating is a step that I, I, I would hop on. And then another step would be to moisturize. Now, one misconception is people with oily skin will tell you, oh, I don't moisturize because I have oily skin. And that's a big mistake because oil and water are different in the sense that, in fact, if you don't moisturize your skin, if you have oily skin and you don't moisturize, you, your skin will tend to compensate by producing more oil. So it's actually even more important for you to moisturize. However, what I found is that people don't have a knowledge of what to use for their skin type. So the first thing is you have to determine your skin type. Am I dry? Am I normal? Am I oily? That is what will determine what kind of products to use, okay? 
And that's where um, the issue of the steps come in, the skincare steps. So if we say cleanse, you want to use the right cleanser for you. If we say exfoliate, you want to use the right exfoliant for you. If we say moisturize, you have to use the right one for you. It doesn't mean you should skip, skip that step because you feel you don't need it. It's um, a vital step. And the last, um, pro the last um, step, very, very important, arguably the most important is protection with SPF, sun protection, which you also went into details about. You want to use your SPF every day. Even when you're at home, you want to use it. In fact, you're advised to reapply it every two hours. This cannot be overemphasized, the protection, sun protection. And it's something you have to take very seriously because um, sun damage leads to skin aging, leads to hyperpigmentation and a host of other factors and problems that your skin can come down with. So looking at my slide, I said uh, a healthy skin mirrors a healthy body. She also mentioned eating properly. That's also very important because it reflects on your skin. Skin health is not about the skin color. A lot of people want to turn yellow. They want to bleach because they feel that skin health means you have to be light complexioned. Not true. So it's not about the color of your skin. You can be as black as charcoal and have healthy glowing skin. And it's not really about the skin type. We're all born with a particular kind of skin. Skin health is not to say that, oh, because I have oily skin, my skin cannot be healthy, or because I have very dry skin, it cannot be healthy, no. It's all about the condition of your skin, what you do to your skin and what condition you put it in. Um, so how, how do we get healthy skin? I've already brushed on that, I've already gone through that. I mentioned to clean, cleanse, to exfoliate, moisturize and protect. It's really very simple. If you do these, you have healthy skin. You don't need to have 10 or 20 steps, okay? If you get the right product and you stick to even these four steps, I promise you that you have healthy skin. And of course, eating healthy as well. So there are common skincare mistakes um, I see um, during my practice and talking with clients. One is not cleaning your phone. So you have, a, the phone is a harbinger of bacteria. And a lot of times you put it on your face. Well, thank God for speakers now and earphones, but I find that a lot of women, they have foundation from 10 days ago on their phone and they slap it back on their face. And that's, that's a mistake. Sleeping with your makeup on, I'm sure everybody knows this. Constantly touching your face, leave your face alone. Don't pick at it, don't pluck at it because it tends to, cause inflammation, which will leave scars, and then it's difficult to remove those. Not drinking enough water. You should drink at least three liters of water a day. It will reflect on your skin. It keeps your skin supple and hydrated. And that's a, a major anti-aging secret, keeping your skin supple and hydrated. Using the same towel on your face as your body, I find that a lot of people do that, but it's wrong. You should have a special towel for your face, which you should change every few days. It's also advised to change your pillowcase every few days. Ignoring your neck. A lot of people focus on the face and they forget their neck. That's a big mistake. You, whatever you're doing to your face, you should do to your neck. When you're cleaning, when you're exfoliating, sun protection, everything you do to your face, do to your neck. In fact, due to your whole body, but because the face and neck are usually the most exposed, you want to take extra care of that. Not wearing SPF. This is very common among black skinned people where they say, oh, but I have melanin. I don't need to wear SPF. You, you do need to wear SPF. Everybody needs to wear SPF. Um, tobacco use is also scientifically proven to damage the skin. Okay, I'm going to rush now, my time is up. And then using products recommended by non-professionals, this has become an, shall I say a pandemic where people just go to Instagram and they begin to buy all sorts of things recommended by non-professionals. It's a big, big problem. And then their skin gets damaged and then they want us to do magic. 
and um, that's where I'll stop now. I think I've <laughs> I've been talking for eight minutes. I don't know if there are questions. All right. Yeah. I mean, you're going to talk about that later. So we're just going to uh, bring Dr. Eriri back because she has a few things to say about uh, skin health. Skin health. I just can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Just need your video off. Oh, oh nice. video on rather. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. All right. Yeah. So well, I'm just say going into what um, Dr. Ifoma has kindly taking her time. She, you can see she's gentler than I am. She's taking her time and speaking and being very, very calm and all of that. Right. Um, so this section, this section of this, we're supposed to be talking healthy skin. And yes, he segued into all what I had said before and push it back again of healthy skin. Um, I just want to add that in addition to all that she said, actually, let me let me let me subtract a little bit first before I add in slight subtraction. So she gave you all that those steps. Healthy skin is correct. Somebody put it in the chat when they went and mentioned is the sum total of. Let me just read it. I think uh, I just uh, yes, skin health is a complete responsibility of taking care of your skin. I think this is Ishaku Daniel which involves nutrition, adequate hydration, and protection against external irritants. Yes, that is correct. In addition, it also means being free of diseases. We need to remember that in talking skin health, optimal skin health is a disease-free skin. We need to remember that um, when we say the skin is the largest organ of the body, it's not just because we want to feel more important than cardiologists or neurologists, no. It's actually because everything that happens in all those other organs will reflect on the skin and vice versa. So the skin is a window. You see the skin before you see all the internal organs of the body. You see the skin before you even decide that I want to even know what else is wrong with this person. So while the skin looks healthy sometimes, and remember we're not talking airbrushing or natural or makeup or filters and Instagram and Snapchat. We're talking a skin that is actually reflecting health. It is from within. And it will be garbage in, garbage out, geigo, as it were. If you don't put in what is right by virtue of eating, it starts well with what you put inside of your skin. What you eat healthy, how you drink, how you nourish your body, because all of those feed into the blood and the blood vessels are going to be all over the entire skin. And that is what is reflecting outwards. So when you talk about skin health, I mean, when we talk about the World Health Organization and their definition of health, we say not just the absence of disease, but also how and the quality of it. So we talk about the disease of the skin as opposed to just looking good. So you can apply quite a lot of things on your skin and it's from the outside and it looks so from the outside. When you come closer, I remember... Um, when I was much younger, my, my older brother used to tease me and say that I was FFF. Uh, you know how young, how siblings can be. The FFF is like, oh, when I'm coming from a distance, they're like, oh, who is that hot babe? And then when they come to I say it's even you. So fine from far, but far from fine. That's what he used to say. And that's what we talk in terms of our skin health. That you could actually apply a lot of things and, the, and you are smiling for the cameras and you're looking supposedly good for the cameras. But we pick a little pill, pinch your skin, and it doesn't just go back. It's taking its time to so you actually are far from fine. So you don't need a lot to bring out the health in your skin, but you need a lot to falsify health of the skin. And that's what Dr. Ifama was saying in terms of products upon products upon products. So people are product junkies. I mean, it's a multi-billion dollar industry in terms of social media skin health. What social media is telling you healthy skin is all about is money. But in reality, that is not healthy skin. So I'll just say going into that. Now, quick one about exfoliation. Not everybody should exfoliate because some people have very sensitive skin. So when we talk in terms of steps towards taking good care of your skin, everything Dr. Ifama has said very correctly apply. But in life, there is no one size fits all. I think that's what I want to be able to just, just sort of bring that out, that one size doesn't fit all. And again, combination, healthy, oily skin 
one human being can have oily skin on one part of the body, combination skin on another part of the body, dry skin on another part of the body, because the body is such a dynamic organ, or rather the skin is such a dynamic organ that you find that depending on what it is that you're going on, where you are, geographical location, the temperature, the ambient, your, your body is doing separate, separate things. So you have to understand your skin and know that sometimes it's not all about just diving in to fix what you consider a problem. Because if your skin is really healthy, it will fix its own problem by itself, given the right care. I don't know. So healthy skin is not impossible to get, but it's not the way we are thinking in terms of why are you looking? I, I don't know how to put it. You see a baby, when you check out the baby, a baby has done very little to make the baby look nice as a healthy baby, you know, everything that, I mean, I think there's another one, there's another uh, PowerPoint I'm going to talk about, but the skin will show a baby who is well taken care of and that who is not well taken care of. Maybe don't. I didn't, I didn't put on my video to say you were run out of time, by the way. Oh, I'm sorry. I Carry thought on. <laughs> I thought okay, let, let me just add something. Whilst yeah. Now, when I said um, exfoliating, I said you didn't put it on the list, but um, I, I hop on it. What I found is that there are actually products for sensitive skin that can exfoliate. Okay. Right. So like, I'm not going to name the brand, but they produced something called a milk foliant that is so mild that no matter how sensitive your skin is, it can be used. So that's why you, if you if you go to let's say an expert or a professional who is well-versed in product knowledge, I think that there's something for everyone. Correct. And it's not something you have to do every day. Exactly. You know, exfoliation. Exactly. I think exactly. that's the mistake people make. I think, yes, I think that's what I wanted to bring out. It's not yeah, every day. want to scrub mm. their skin every day, every day. No, you know, so what I found in recent times anyway, is that they have produced exfoliants for people with very sensitive skin, made with milk, something so mild that it doesn't abrase the skin. Because I can see someone here mentioning microdermabrasion. That's, that's too much. Form. That's too much. Uh -huh. um, I see someone that says exfoliating is not for everyone. I have sensitive skin and that causes more. What have you been using to exfoliate your skin? You know, so in my own experience, I think that there are some products that are so mild that you can use them once a week just to get rid of what your cleanser is not getting rid of. That's my own experience anyway. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so you, 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 um, Dr. Ephraim are correct. Now the point to, I think where maybe we might have um, issues, people are thinking, what does exfoliation really mean? Mm, I think yeah. I think a priori, maybe we didn't define that. And so, because- okay. the average how often person, should we do it? Yeah, so the and average- how often? Yeah. So, so the average person, We'll, talk, we'll think about exfoliation with those um, beaded products in some cleansers. That's it, exactly. You know, how, okay. And you feel like you need to, like, you know how you're going to find it, like really do you like a scrub, skin. exactly. So right. not necessarily because there are oh. products, quite rightly, like you said, that are like your regular liquid cleanser, liquid. which actually have yeah. exfoliating properties. Okay. However, however, because most of them are mild acids, weak acids, because that's what is going to break down the stratum corneum. Those what is mm. what you want to really exfoliate because your stratum corneum are basket weaves of cells that uh, when they are subjected to the right um, uh, pH, they separate and so they can fall off. You know, that, those dead cells, instead of waiting for the 28 day cycle or 32 day cycle of your natural skin, they kind of hasten it. So the point being that people should know what it is that they use on their skin because you will feel it. Your skin will tell you if you are sensitive, you know, the still small voice, not of God now of the skin will tell you when you have done something that your skin is not happy with. You will feel that slight tingling, but you know, the average human being thinks that when they feel a smartness, if he's relaxed on the head, or so, it means that the thing is working very hard. You are, your body is telling you that there's a problem. But well, you want to go ahead and tell yourself that, oh, the harsher I do this, the better it's it's supposed to be. Not necessarily so. So on the average, we say that exfoliate with the right product once maximum twice a week. Twice a week. Yeah. Maximum twice a week. 
The problem mm -hmm. is, what is the right product? Instagram tells everybody something else. Snapchat gives you some other mm -hmm. information. Google is my competitor on a daily basis. So I'm like, okay, so what do I want to do now? You know, but a discerning clients in your case or patients in my case or patient clients, however, will be able to tell you that this is what happens to me when I do this. And then sometimes subject your skin to a test. Your skin can take this, your skin cannot take this. But the one thing that goes for everybody is that you need a gentle, pH-friendly cleanser. That is most important, as well as a moisturizer. You cannot go wrong with those two. You cleanse gently, you moisturize with onto damp skin, and you sun protect or sun avoid. Et voilà. Mm. Okay, someone is asking whether teenagers should follow same skin routine. Yes. Yes, keep it basic, like Dr. Harris said. You don't have to use 10 steps. You don't have to do 10 steps, 20 steps. There's no need for that. And teenagers, however, teenagers are prone to acne. Their skin tends to be more oily. So what they use should be tailored to oh, what the skin condition is showing. So I think that um, the important thing you should go home with is that everybody's condition is different. Everybody's skin type is different. What works for A doesn't necessarily work for B. So you need a professional to guide you in what you should use for what your skin. extra What extra you should, you should the, use? The, the basic should be basic across board because we don't, I mean, I'm just saying, adding to what you're saying that we don't want people to go about thinking the skincare is such a complicated process that they need to go start yeah. looking. Yes, it's actually simple, simple and basic. And the simpler it is, the better for you. Because that way, when you do have a problem, you can actually paint it. But when you're using multiple things, you're not too certain what's cotton what, and then it becomes a bit of uh, uh, to do. Fab, thank you. Now, there's a question I want to ask. Yes. Okay. So oh, someone said, what is SPF? But I think someone's answered in the, in the chat. What okay. SPF should black skin people should be using? Is it depending on how dark you are? What no. number should you be using? Um, I already mentioned 50. For me, that's ideal as well. Sometimes I have clients coming with SPF 100, and I said, that's not really necessary because the protection that 50 gives you is not much different from what 100 gives you. So you don't have to spend so much saying, I'm getting SPF 100 or 130 or, I think 50 as a standard. Some people say 30 as a minimum, but I think an optimal number would be 50. Okay, so if you are light skin then, the 50 same. still. Yes. As long as you've got melanin, 50. I think everyone, 50 is a safe number for everyone. So, so okay. if, we, if we understand what SPF actually really means, then you realize yes. that what she's saying is correct. SPF 70, SPF, if you, except you have shares in the company. I don't see what you're doing with it. <laughs> because SPF 50 is already going to give you, it's going to block 90% of UVB rays, and then you are good. That's the honest truth. Any other thing is a bit of an overkill, and an overkill in the sense that it's really not doing much for you. Much the important thing is for you to use it judiciously, appropriately, adequately. Problem is that SPF rarely is used properly. You need to use almost, I mean, when you think about how they produce it in the, in the, in the pharmaceutical labs, you need to be using almost like a, th a teaspoon full of and reapplying that as much as you can. And that's why prior, prior to now, they used to say that the mineral sunscreens, the ones that leave the whitish cast on your, on your skin, were better because they formed like a physical Next. blocker per mm -hmm. se, as opposed to the chemical sunscreen, which have to kind of like go into your body and have a chemical reaction to reflect the ultraviolet um, rays that you're trying to avoid getting into the skin. Having said so, an SPF 50 is more than it's sufficient for anybody who is using it. It's not how dark you are or whether the sun in your, your place in Ghana is hotter than the sun in, in Nigeria or hotter than what is, I mean, you can now, you guys have hotter sun than we do. So we can give you all our SPS if you want. Thank you, you're so kind. All Thank right, you. we're gonna go, we're still going to take your questions at the end if we can't take them now. So, you know, don't leave and I haven't ignored you, but I just wanna move on to the next speaker. Um, so we're not too far behind. So our next speaker is Mr. Dayo, Dayo Simi. He's a pharmacist with over 15 years experience and he's, he's the managing director of Cassville Pharmacy in Lagos, Nigeria. And he's going to talk to us about some of the common problems he encounters in the pharmacy. All right, so Dayo, over to you. 
Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Okay, I'm happy to be here. Uh, thank you for the opportunity given to me. So I will just, uh, can you enable me to share my screen? Yes, that's done. Okay, thank you. So I have just eight minutes, so I will just <laughs> go straight um, to the topic. Yes, common skin problems. We've talked about uh, what is skin, the layers of skin, so I'll not go into that. So let me just go straight to skin problems. These are conditions affecting the skin and it includes all conditions that causes irritation, inflammation, rashes, or any other change in the body, in the skin appearance. So we discuss some of these conditions. Some of them are life-threatening. Some are not, uh, the symptoms are not so harmful, while some are just mild. Cause of common skin problems. Skin problems are generally caused by either virus, fungi, bacteria, or parasites. And it could also be as a result of weakened immune system or gene genetic factors, or even our lifetime. What we eat, the kind of stress we go through, the kind of creams we use, and so on. So we have a lot of skin problems that we see on a daily basis in the pharmacy. I'll just talk briefly on six of them, which include acne, eczema, psoriasis, chicken pox, scabies, and uh, athletic food. So because of I'll just um, over them. Uh, acne. Acne is a condition where the skin pores become clogged with oil, bacteria, and dead skin, resulting in pimples all over the face, the head, and the uh, shoulders, just like we can see on the screen. It's usually common with teenagers between age uh, 14 to 24, but it can also occur among uh, adults. So some of the causes are fluctuating hormon hormonal levels, stress, high immunity, and using oily products. Treatment and prevention tips. Just like uh, Ereri and Flora said, wash your face at least twice a day with mild soap and uh, warm water. Avoid picking or squeezing pimples. Ensure you don't sleep with your makeup on. Wash your face before you sleep. You can also use washes and creams to remove dirt and bacteria. We also spoke about uh, the use of sunscreen. This is also important for prevention of uh, acne. Then other forms of, of treatment include the use of antibiotics, anti-androgen medicines, contraceptives, oral acetretinol, and so on. But please note, these are now over-the-counter medications and they need to be prescribed by your doctor or your dermatologist. So don't just walk to the pharmacy and pick this uh, product without proper guidance. Then we move to eczema. Eczema, also known as uh, atopic dermatitis, is an inflama inflammation con uh, inflammatory condition of skin that makes the skin to turn red, dry, itchy, and bumpy, just like this. For dark skin um, people, it could appear as dark brown, niche color on the skin. The main causes is not known by scientists, but we believe that it's a combination of immune and genetic uh, factors, as well as environmental factors. 
treatments and management. The treatment is difficult, especially if something, if the cause is something we cannot control, just like genetics. But in managing it, the main goal is to reduce itching, discomfort, and flare-ups. So you can use the modifier. Moisturizer is also good to ensure that the skin is stays hydrated. We drink lots of water, just like our previous speaker has uh, said. Then the use of mild soap without perfume is also important. Also, in order to reduce the itching, your, your doctor could also prescribe aura or topical antihistamines as well as steroids. So please know that long-term use of steroids will cause side effects like weight gain and thinning of the skin. So just like any other medicine, please consult your doctor before you use uh, these medicines. Psoriasis is a skin disorder that causes the skin cells to multiply abnormally. Uh, Flora told us that it takes about an average of 28 days for the skin to the skin cells to die. So in the case of psoriasis, because of the immune autoimmune uh, con condition defects, the skin the skin cells multiply abnormally in such a way that before the skin dies, multiple layers of, of skin cells would have been produced, forming like the scales on the skin, on our skin, on the body. So just like I said earlier, it is caused by a defect in our immune system. Treatment, for now, there is no definite cure for psoriasis. But the available treatment is aimed at slowing down the rate of growth of the cells of the skin and also to, to reduce itchy and uh, the dry skin. For example, for dry skin, you can use moisturizer to ensure that your skin stays hydrated. Antihistamines could also be used to ensure to relieve um, the itching. So I, uh, steroid creams can also be prescribed by a doctor or vitamin D-based uh, ointments. Chicken pox. It is a viral infection that causes itchy and blister-like rash on the skin. Very contagious, highly contagious especially for those that have not been vaccinated with uh, chicken pox vaccine before, or those that have not uh, encountered that particular infection before. Some of the symptoms include tiredness, fever, loss of appetite, headache, and so on. Prevention. It can be prevented by vaccination, just like I stated earlier. And treatment is usually aimed at um, relieving symptoms, fever, each headache, and the rest. On the use of pain relievers for to treat fever, it is advisable that we use paracetamol, otherwise known as acetaminophen, as pain relievers such as aspirin and ibuprofen can worsen the situation. So this is another reason we, we need to consult our doctor or pharmacist before we take um, medications. Topical preparations such as calamine lotion and antihistamine can also help to reduce the itching. So we need to avoid over scratching of, of the body so that we prevent or minimize the spread of the infection. And we should drink lots of water so that we stay hydrated. Your doctor will also prescribe antiviral drugs if necessary. Otherwise, within eight to two weeks, naturally, the chickenpox uh, disease should 
go. If it doesn't go, your doctor may decide to prescribe um, antiviral drugs if necessary. Then we talk on scabies. Scabies is also a common skin problem that we see on a daily basis in the pharmacy in Nigeria. Uh, it's a skin infestation caused by mites underneath the skin. It is, it is also contagious by physical contact. And the main symptoms is intense itching. It involves the use of, the treatment involves the use of oral or topical scabicidal drugs to kill both the mites and the eggs that is laid underneath the skin. Also, the use of antihistamine could also help to reduce the itching. The last one is athlete foot. It's a skin condition that is caused by fungal infection. And it can spread from the feet to the toenails and the ants. I'm sure we are used to, to this kind of picture for pharmacists. Um, symptoms, itching between toes and soles of the feet, blisters all over the feet, then cracking and peeling of the feet. Also, the, the nails could be discolored and thick. So if you have symptoms like this, probably you have um, an athlete foot and you need to see your doctor. So prevention, what are the things we can do to prevent athlete foot? Avoid visiting public places with bare foot. Avoid sharing of stores or clothing with infected persons. And avoid wearing closed, tight shoes. Also, avoid keeping feet wet for long period, especially for those that sweat a lot and um, to minimize the growth of the fungus. Majorly, it mainly can be treated with the use of oral or topical antifungal medications. So in summary, there are plenty of numerous conditions with wide range of symptoms. Armless, some could have moderate symptoms and some could have severe symptoms. Skin problem could also be a, a, a sign or an indication that we have an underlying illness that we need to pay attention to. So when we observe any changes in our skin, I would advise we see professionals, the dermatologists and doctors and avoid um, self-medication. So thank you. Thank you so much, Daya, so for giving us an insight into the common skin problem that you see in the pharmacy. Um, I'm going to go over to Dr. Ifoma now, and she's going to talk about the common skin problem she sees in her clinic. All right. Ifoma, over to you. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah. So. I've kept it pretty simple. I just put pictures. Um, Dio has gone quite deep into a lot of the um, definitions of the different problems. And I just put pictures of what I see every day in my aesthetic practice. Um, common skin problem that I see in my practice, acne. So I've put them in order of how I see them, like, you know, in order of um, frequency. And acne is the single most important, the single most frequent condition that we see at the clinic. And there are many um, levels and grades and types, you know, but basically there's mild, moderate and severe acne. And we tend to see more of the moderate versions and acne is quite simply an inflammatory reaction of the pilosebaceous unit in the skin. 
and it's caused more often by um, sebum, sebum or oily skin, like some people call it. Um, there's also a bacteria implicated in, in acne. Um, then there's also a hormonal aspect to it as well. And sometimes a combination of these factors will cause acne. And more often than not, uh, when people come to us, they're concerned not just about the acne, but also about the PIH that comes with the acne, PIH being the post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, otherwise known as dark spots. Or like most people call it, most of our clients call it scars. They call it acne scars. But scars are actually quite different from PIH. So just a quick education, the scars, are, when you say acne scars, we're not referring to the dark spots. What you should be referring to is if there are indentations in your skin. I don't have a picture of that, but well, this guy actually has a few indentations in the skin. Those are the actual scars. The dark spots are what we call PIH, and it comes from picking at your skin. Sometimes even when you don't pick your skin, you will get PIH. But if you pick at your skin, you make it worse and you make it harder to treat. So this is one of the most frequent conditions we see, I see in my practice. Um, and what we do in terms of treating it is to put you on a good skincare routine. This is someone that will benefit from exfoliating with a mild acid because that will help to clean out well, that's why I'm so big on exfoliation because I see a lot of this and I find that people are not using the right washes or cleansers or products. And just by tweaking their skincare routine and giving them the right products with mild acids that help to exfoliate and clean out the pores, we see massive improvement. Um, we also have treatment modalities for acne, such as chemical peels. We have micro needling for the scars, if there are any, and generally for texture. But basically we have found that uh, a rough estimate would be to say that 70% of our clients improve from using proper skin care targeted towards acne. So that's acne. Then for the PIH, um, more often than not, we have to use um, mild lightening products and do treatments like pills to get rid of that. Um, we do not bleach the skin. We do not advocate bleaching the skin to get rid of the spots because that will cause more damage to your skin. And we've also found that when people try to bleach the spots, they end up having um, a rebound and what we call um, um, product induced acne where they have even worse, uh, a worse reaction from using the wrong products in trying to bleach the dark spots. And then they end up having worsening acne, okay? So that is what we are faced with. Um, the second biggest thing is hyperpigmentation. And I, the, the first picture shows a woman, um, on the left side is what her skin should look like if it's even healthy, just like we described, moisturized. And on the other side is a diffuse darkening. So this is not PIH where there are dark spots, you know, specific dark spots, but there's a diffuse darkening all over the face. And I will say that this woman is not using sunscreen, <laughs> you know? So I found that when people don't use sunscreen, they have a diffuse darkening of the face and their face and neck tends to look darker than areas that are covered because the, the face and neck is exposed to the sun. So I can safely say that this hyperpigmentation is from not using sunscreen and maybe not from, maybe not using the right products um, cleansers as well. But I would say the sun is, will be the number one culprit here. And that's why using sunscreen is so important. So she, of course she's black, right? And a lot of black people say, oh, I don't need sunscreen because I have melanin already. But you can see the effect of not using sunscreen, which is that your skin gets darker. And that to us is not healthy skin. Um, then on the right is a popular 
condition we see as well, melasma, which um, it has a hormonal component, but it's made worse by not using sunscreen as well. And, and so I'll, I'll say that, you know, we said to have healthy skin, clean, moisturize, sunscreen. You see the importance of sunscreen in keeping healthy skin, you know? So it, the skin might not be diseased, so to speak. You might, not, you might not have psoriasis or eczema and all the other ones Dio told us about, but is your skin really healthy if you have uneven pigmentation and patches? I would say no. So on the aesthetic path, I would say sunscreen is very important. Um, ochronosis, this is a fallout of using the wrong products, exogenous ochronosis to be specific. It's a fallout of using the wrong products. A lot of people are into bleaching and lightening their skin now. And this is the fallout, especially, and what I found is that they don't even use sunscreen. So you find people using hydroquinone and mercury and all sorts of bleaching products, and they use it for such a long time. And then they don't use sunscreen on top of all that. And this could happen where you have um, a bluish grayish discoloration, which has gone dermal. And this is very, very hard to treat. Very, very hard to treat. You don't want to get into this condition. So the advice would be keep away from bleaching products, keep away from products not recommended by professionals. Um, and of course, follow the steps we've talked about. Cleanse, moisturize, and sunscreen. Um, I saw a question earlier about whether it's necessary to reapply sunscreen continuously. Yes, it is because the sun breaks down the sunscreen after a while and you need to reapply it to keep it effective. So it's very important to reapply during the course of the day. And the next condition um, I, we see a lot is alopecia. And um, this is quite distressing to a lot of women. With the advent of wearing wigs, <laughs> when women take off their wigs, a lot of women come, when they take off their wigs, they're like, whoa, <laughs> you know? And now this comes about as a, this is, traction alopecia from tight braiding, tight weavings, frontaling your wig, wearing very tight wigs, you know, and it's quite unnecessary, you know, and if you know that um, this would happen from, from not taking care in terms of weaving your hair and wearing the right kind of hair dressing, you would avoid it. But by the time they come, uh, it's almost like, oh, I didn't know that that was what was causing the problem. So education is very important in terms of um, educating them on not weaving their hair too tightly, tight ponytails, all those things contribute to this and it could be easily prevented just by having proper hair care. Of course, if you, you should also use the right hair products. Um, that moisturize, just like the skin needs to be moisturized, the hair also needs to be kept supple, soft, moisturized all the time. So this is also common. And to treat it, um, there are treatment options. It takes time. Um, people advocate for microneedling with PRP. Um, there's also, um, some people also use threading. So there are treatment options. Um, if caught on time, as long as the follicles are still intact and there's no scarring, this can be treated. Of course, you have to stop whatever it is you were doing that caused it in the first place. So there's hope in terms of alopecia, traction alopecia. And then this is another condition we see quite often, surprisingly, um, DPN, dermatosis papulosa nigra, and they're like, tiny papules all over the skin. Sometimes they're very few, sometimes they're many. And there's no known cause per se, but believe it or not, sun damage has also been implicated in um, the pathogenesis of DPN. It's hereditary as well. You find that it runs in families. 
And if a relative had this, it kind of makes you more prone to having DPN as well. However, what I found is that if you start using sun protection on time, it actually reduces the incident. So here we, we are back to the, uh, we're back to sun protection being very important in preventing a lot of these conditions. Another um, popular um, condition we see at the clinic is keloids. Um, this is a black man's disease mostly, and it's an excessive growth of scar tissue from an injury. And this lady probably got it from piercing her ears in multiple places. And I promise you, it's so common. It's so common. Sometimes it's seen on the chest. Sometimes it's seen around the chin, the jawline. You find it in men as well um, that shave or sometimes at the back of their heads, even though that has a different name, AKN, acne, kinodialis, nuke. But they are all around the same pathogenesis of excess scar tissue, and it's quite common as well. And the treatment, depending on the size, sometimes we inject um, Kenalog, which is a steroid, into it to flatten it. It doesn't remove it completely, but it makes it look better. And sometimes excision is necessary in order to remove the excess skin, and then you inject it with Kenalog. Um, I think th that's, yeah, those are the most popular conditions that I see at the clinic. And I just wanted to share them with you. So I don't know if there are questions. Thank you. We'll take them at the end because we're running over time. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I can see all the questions coming in. So you can have a look and then prepare for it at the end. We'll, 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 take, we'll take them. I don't know. Continue. Okay. So we'll take them at the end. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ifama. So now we are going to talk about skin health across the ages. How does the skin change? Uh, if I might just stop uh, sharing for me, please. Okay. Great, thank you. And so Dr. Irere is going to take that for us. All right, Irere, over to you. Are you able to share? It should be. Can you hear yeah. me? Yes, yeah. I can. Just a minute. Great. I just want to bring it up now. Hold on a minute. Thank you, Dr. Ifoma. Uh, so just like... Uh, can you can you hear me please? Yes. Okay. A bit louder would be good. Okay. Of course. Ap apologies. Thank you. Is this loud enough? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. This is a tough order trying to do skin health, skin across the ages. Can you see my screen? Yeah. I would try. It's a lot. That's a lot. I mean, but I'm just going to try as much as possible to give you what I consider a little bit of uh, some pearls, okay? Um, so just a quick disclosure that yes, the pictures I'm about to share, I have consent from the patients to use it to teach and nothing more. Now, again, going back to skin, sorry, what's the big deal? We're talking skin again, this preamble. I mentioned earlier on that the social media skin and skin may be slightly different. There's a relationship, but what's the big deal? It makes a lot of money, you know? People are doing so many things in the background. We have natural mixologies. We have those who are having organic skin care content, mixing yesterday's uh, oatmeal and today's tomatoes, putting it all together that's all, it's all natural and it's supposed to be good for you. And sometimes they use these on babies. They use this on teenagers, people who are growing and there's so much going on. And of course, I put there the hairy nation. Dr. Ifama ended, we're talking about alopecia and all the things that are going on. I'm wearing a wig, she's wearing a wig. People are making money off the wigs. What else are we doing wrong or doing right as the case may be? We cannot ignore the fact that what you do to your skin or what you do to your baby's skin or what anybody does will have an impact somewhat as we go on in life. What is normal skin? We've mentioned all of this. 
But I want to ask now that does it really exist when we talk about what should be just normal? Does it exist? And if it does exist, what determines that it stays normal? When we use the word normal, it's like um, uh, the average. Everything should just be okay. Ceteris paribus, you know. As you grow in life, would your skin stay normal what it was when you were a baby? Not likely. We've mentioned healthy skin, that it should be smooth and even toned. It shouldn't have any breakages, no scars. It should reflect light with no filters. And it should be disease free. We emphasize. And all of this should happen without makeup, just like this. It's not photo finish, or is it? And it should look like this. Is this photo finish or it isn't? Everybody looks all nice and glowy, but there is makeup. How do we achieve this and how do we maintain this? In the utopia, across the ages, a neonate who is less than a month old is all nice and rosy, sweet, supple cheek, clear skin, no drama, sleeping when you want them to sleep, waking up when you want them to wake up, pooping when you want them to poop and not when you are tired. And a child wants to play ball and feel good and not cry unnecessarily. Skin is healthy, he or she is not scratching. A teenager is acne free and not stressing about the fact that his hair or her hair is not is not doing what it needs to be done and he can pop and do something on social media without a problem. A young adult is thinking of the fact that at this point in my life, I should just be able to glow and meet the next person and think, yes, I'm having a partner. The middle age is thinking all the stress I go through on a daily basis trying to make money or two and take care of my family. Because the younger ones feel the elderly shouldn't reflect. I shouldn't have sag skin. I should be able to just sleep and wake up when I want to. But that's a utopia. In the words of Louis Armstrong, what a wonderful world we live in. The skies are all blue and gray. Hey, is that really happening? This is what we have in reality. When the elements, fire, sun, water, the earth, bring to bear all their drama. When we have communicable diseases, you are on your own. You had no problem. And somebody brought a disease out to you simply because your child went to school, brought in scabies. Or the non-communicable diseases where you have something that you inherited with genodermatosis or where the food you ate is actually the one causing you problem because it wasn't well made or the vaccines that you took. We remember the whole saga with measles, mumps and rubella and the drama with it and having autism or ADD as the case may be attention deficit disorder. And you see this child and somebody wants to go attempt to treat a child that has this discoloration in a seeming pattern, not realizing that actually this is some sort of navels and is inherited and there's nothing you can do about it except you want to go maybe the laser way when they are much older. So in reality, it's not a utopia. Things happen. And so that normal skin is not exactly normal in the way you and I want to think about it. I mean, I came across this article. I talked about the fact that, yes, we know that the skin is the largest organ in the body and everything is all hunky-dory. But it tells you that because we have interesting kind of environmental factors that contribute to the progressive deterioration of the skin with increasing age, we cannot avoid cutaneous problems. And the inevitable consequences of aging skin, which will prove to both be cosmetically unacceptable as well as life-threatening if skin breaks down, is there. It stares us in the face and we have to realize them. So when I mentioned earlier on that the skin is healthy when it is also free of disease, it's extremely important. Can we be completely without skin disease? Not likely because our life is linked with other people. So in the stages of life, what is implicated? We've talked about the elements. Talking in terms of gravity and senescence, which is aging, the aging process. And our lifestyle habits, what exactly do they do for our skin? Diet and nutrition as well as diseases. We'll take a little bit of it. I won't waste too much time. I apologize. I was supposed to have started my timer. Really, I hope you're timing me. Give me a pointer when necessary. So look at aged skin and look at the epidermis. This one that is all contoured from the outside. This is the stratum corneum, uh, epidermis rather, with the stratum corneum in the contour. And then beneath it in the, in the dermis, where your collagen is, we see we see the collagen fibers 
are disordered and scattered and in all manner of disarray here, as opposed to the young skin where everything is even. And so this is the texture you see on top. Everything looks all very even, smooth, plain, no bricks, no pits, no scars. Underneath is all nice and supple. The collagen bunches are well arranged. And this is the effect outwards. Everything is all nice and hunky-dory. Here you start to see the little wrinkles. Here you start to see your marionette lines. Here you start to see the, um, the corners of the lips and all their wrinkles and even the skin, the neck of the skin is all folded. Collagen bundle is breaking and it's the, the, the center cannot hold. Things are falling apart as it were. What do we do next? So gravity. We can't avoid gravity as we get older. I'm using the face particularly, but think about anything that has um, a load of a sort and then it, it, what's happening to the, to the uh, part of the body beneath. So when the person is younger, this same page, signs of face aging by periods, here everything is still intact. The skin of the eye, the corners of the eyes are normal. The cheeks are well. The philtrum is all intact. The lips are all nice and supple and well puckered. But as you get older, you start to have static lines it starts to be dynamic after a while it becomes static you have the eyes beginning beginning to wrinkle it starts with laugh lines and wrinkle so if you if you see the skin of a person who hasn't changed over the years that person hasn't had any muscular movement at all and that's not possible because as you talk as you chew as you eat as you smile as you frown all the things that just make you you your skin shows it because the muscles underneath are being used and the effect of gravity is visible as you age with even more downturning of your nasal labial folds, more downturning of your lips. The upper lip becomes thinner, sometimes to disappearing in the Caucasians because Africans have thicker lips, so you tend to still see something. That is what happens with gravity. Uh, there is this age app that I know they see on social media. I'm not too sure which of them now, where you can actually put in your face and it tell you what your face should look like. And it gives you an idea of how it is. They are using all of these lines and that's how they're able to give. So this 53-year-old man, he, he actually has an app age almost correct to saying 50 because they imputed all of them. So that's robotic age. We're going into the area of personalized medicine where... Um, the, the, the computer can actually tell you what you need to do. We're moving. The medical people hopefully will still be involved, but everybody is now going into big data and we're trying to get better and better advances. And maybe, maybe we can stop the aging process. Who knows? Okay, so what happens really in, in women as opposed to men? This is an article I found in the Daily Mail that as women age, we have the protective estrogen. Men have estrogen, but not as much as women do. Women have androgens, but not as much as men do, the sex hormones. The loss of the estrogen will cause the woman to start to age even faster. So initially, we are almost level pegging. Then you get to puberty, and then women, are, um, women have that their peak initially earlier. Then the guys jump up, jump into it later, later things. Then they get to have more estrogen. They get the, the peak menopause, then they start to drop the estrogen. They start to age as much as you can possibly. So by the age between 50 and 60, the aging is so fast with sagging of the lateral brow here. Their eyelids will droop and you begin to look like you're tired even when you're not. You hear people telling you that, ah, did you sleep well? You have eye bags. All that gravity is going on. The fold between your nose begins to deepen and your face flattens due to fat loss, bone loss, fat loss. All of this is extrinsic, you can see it, but it's actually due to an intrinsic problem, what we call senescence. So this, this is just for labs. I was just looking, I know everybody knows that monkeypox is uh, kind of raining now. And I just came across this on social media. It was so funny as I just thought to share. This is how this person is thinking that he has monkeypox. So he's going to tell his boss that he won't come into work today. So that was just an aside from too much stuff. So let's talk about diseases and age, age. You know, generally, certain diseases are common in age groups, and we think in terms of maybe a child or a neonate who is still trying to develop immunity, is still trying to be his or her own person in the world coming up from the mother's womb. They tend to be prone to viral diseases because we would know that viruses, um, the manifestation of a viral disease is usually a function of how strong or how healthy the person who has a disease is in terms of immune system. So a child who is still developing immunity will succumb to a viral ailment like measles or chicken pox and all those other things. 
more commonly than an adult. However, that's not to say that adults can have viral diseases, but there are certain things you expect to see in a child that you don't expect to see in an adult, except the adult is immune compromised with maybe diabetes or a little bit of uh, or HIV or any of all the, maybe like, God forbid, the cancer, any of the um, malignancies. Then genodematosis are uh, uh, genetic disorders that affect the skin and the skin cells, skin appendages, they're usually also seen in the young. So you don't expect to see a genodematosis like maybe, um, or even if you see it in an, in an adult, something like neurofibromatosis, I think I have a picture I'll show you, in an adult, except maybe they didn't talk about it or nobody knew anything about it and they've been managing it, which is what we tend to do in this part of the world, manage a problem until the child becomes an adult and you become a bit more conscious and then you want to you want to see if you can do something about it. Bacterial infections on the other hand are common across all age groups, probably seen in toddlers when they start to pick things and they're moving up and down because as babies you might not have too much except there's a break in the skin and you introduce bacteria or they have like um, one of the community acquired um, infections. Um, fungi are ubiquitous. There you have fungi everywhere. The fungi are all on the floor. You have to fungi in the soil, fungi in, in, in animals. And so you can have fungi across all ages, fungal sort of diseases. More often than not, your body can fix fungi, except it's overwhelming or you have some sort of immune compromise. In the teenage years and in young adults, you tend to have a lot more hormone related disorders, which will usually correct themselves if you don't do too much intervention. And then we have inflammatory diseases or dermatosis in the young adults and middle age. Like I said, it's a bit of a tall order. So trying to go through all of them would be a problem. So I will speak to pictures for the most part. Now, uh, uh, sorry, Dr. Rere, they want you to speak louder, please. Oh, wow. Increase your volume, please. Thank okay. you. Okay, sorry about that. Is this louder? I'm being trying yeah, to going. shout now. <laughs> I, should, I should keep going. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. So dermatosis with aging can be lifestyle related. I think Dio mentioned something about that. In fact, it is lifestyle related. And we talk in terms of environmental dermatosis. I had mentioned the sun, the air, and the wind and the earth and all of those things. Or stress related dermatosis. In fact, stress related dermatosis are almost synonymous with inflammatory disorders. When you think in terms of that, inflammatory disorders are not necessarily infection, but some do it with environmental problems with free radicals in the air, as well as a background tendency, maybe a genetic predisposition to having sort of problem. So psoriasis comes straight to mind, lichen planus as a dermatosis comes to mind in this sort of things. Even alopecia, stress-related dermatosis can come to mind here. Nutritional dermatosis are also related with aging. So the things that you would have, have done or have had as a child, you're probably not eating so much again and or you have overeating disorder. So the obesity and obesity related dermatosis are there. Allergic dermatosis, for instance, um, we will tend to see across board because allergy is different from maybe like an irritant. So if you're allergic to something, you would likely always be allergic to something. So you can have it as a child, you can have it as an adult, you can have it in the middle age. Infectious diseases, depending on whatever microbe we're talking about, can cut across for us. And then sexually transmitted diseases, sort of like what we have here. Now, this is the one that you don't expect to see in certain ages. For instance, you wouldn't expect to be seen this uh, kissing lesions, you can see these are uh, like scars, uh, breakages in the gluteal clefts as the botox, the crack between the botox of the patient. And I'm not expecting to see this in a child. I'm not expecting to see this in an adult who isn't, who isn't sexually, uh, sorry, in the teenager who isn't sexually active. However, you can see these sort of things because there is some sort of contagion. Remember that viruses are contagious in their manner of speaking. And we might talk in terms of sexually transmissible as opposed to sexually transmitted, i.e. you don't have to have penetrative intercourse, but you can have intimate skin-to-skin -skin contact to have some of the sexually transmitted. So this is herpes, this is herpes simplex, as we see. I don't expect to see this in a young child, dermatosis with aging. Now, skin aging, if we want to think about it, we talk about intrinsic aging as well as extrinsic aging. Now, intrinsic aging has to do with things that happen that you can't do anything about is for senescence. You get older, your skin thin, thins out because you're losing your fat cells, you're losing your collagen, you're losing your elastin, you're losing your 
you are increasing your trans epidermal water loss. So the skin becomes very wrinkled and easily folded and is not able to return back, you know, that whole toggle. It's not able to return back to its uh, mass. There's reduction of underlying fault. You have bone density loss, especially in women, you know, because as they get older, as they become more menopausal, they have a loss of bone density. They have um, uh, osteoporotic changes tend to happen. Then the skin sags. So if you were very big at some point, you'll find that, that you look older. If you, even if you're not trying to, um, let's assume that you're trying to lose some weight. People who, people who are bigger, people who are chubby, tend to look a little bit younger than the skinnier people, so to speak, because it gives you some cushion. You kind of like have like a baby skin. But when you try to lose it, you start to look even older. So that's intrinsic aging. And when your skin is dry, it will cost you to scratch. Dry skin is synonymous with pruritus. You will scratch. One of the reasons why we keep saying moisturize the skin. The skin also starts to have reduced sweat production because of the senescence and it loses its melanocyte activity. And so you tend to see grain, especially of the hairs, the grain of the hair on the scalp, of the hair of the pubis, of the hair of your mustache, as the case may be. Those are intrinsic aging. You barely can do anything about it, even though we know that science is all the rave now and they're trying to reverse aging as much as possible. We do have studies, but that's not what this uh, session is about. Extrinsic aging, on the other hand, has to do with things that you could avoid and see if you can reduce your effects on intrinsic aging, which you can't avoid. So if you look at this picture, these are twins, actually. One of them smokes and one of them doesn't. If we had like a Q&A session, I'll have had to ask you who, which of them do you think is smoking and why? But I don't have the time for that, I'm thinking. So with extrinsic aging, what are you doing? How are you eating the food that you are eating? You have a poor diet because you're thinking of all the Fs. You are in a hurry. You want to get to work. So you're taking fast food, which is fried, which is processed, which is not organic as it were. You want to smoke whether tobacco or shisha or what of the other, whatever things it is. They will aid you because they are carcinogens inducers and they bring out a lot of the free radicals that you're trying to avoid. You also have to remember that even if you particularly do not smoke, people around you smoke as a passive smoker, inhaling all the smoking, uh, uh, all the things that come out with smoking, you know, with nicotine and um, cotinine, which is actually another um, product, byproduct of smoking, you will actually have extrinsic aging involved. Alcohol, I want to take a bottle of wine every now and then. I want to take a glass of wine. I want to go have a party. Alcohol, not in moderation, will cause dehydration. It will weaken the vessels that's your uh, it's vessels and cause easy bruising. So you find that your skin becomes dull and dry and easily breaks and you have blotches. And you wonder that, oh, I need to put on some more foundation. I need to put on some more. No, it's probably what it is that you're doing because alcohol has that dehydrating effect and it takes out water from your skin. If you don't sleep well, it will show on your face. Your body has reduce the ability to fight diseases and repair whatever damage it is that has been caused throughout the day when you were moving up and down in traffic. Lagos traffic is not for children, honestly. You have pollution from generators, from cars, from those who are smoking, and it keeps your uh, free radicals in the air suspended to cause you all the harm. And so if you look at this lady, they are in their, these, these are elderly women, by the way, they are in their 60s, almost 70s, if I remember correctly, the article. But if you look at the skin here and you look at her skin, there's a bit more sag here. Deeper laugh lines, she's got a bit more skin toggle here compared to this lady. And look at her lips here. It almost looks as if she even has a problem. Maybe she has like some sort of paresis, like a weakness of her sort. But more bags, more droopy skin compared to this. As you get older, your skin, your eyes even become smaller. So she smokes and she doesn't. They are identical twins and there is obvious difference in them. We've talked about the sun. I'm going to go a little bit in depth about the sun, the bad and the ugly of the sun. There is the good of the sun, only if we use it properly. So talking about the sun, I put this slide up before. I'm going to go a little bit about it. Again. If you look at this ultraviolet A, ultraviolet A goes all the way to the dermis. Ultraviolet B is at epidermal level. It hasn't quite gotten to the dermis. And ultraviolet C is just above the skin surface. All of this and the invisible light rays are there, scattered. Now, ultraviolet A is responsible for dermatoheliosis, which is uh, uh, 
diseases associated with the light, uh, sunlight. And photoheliosis is aging skin from the light. And photoheliosis will wake, weaken collagen and elastin, whether we like it or not, which is why as you get older, you have more of the damage that happens with sun exposure. Dr. Ifema talked about dermato dermatosis papulosa nigrans. It is a photoheliotic condition. People have it genetically, but as they get older, it becomes even more. But UVA is present all daylight hours. So long as there is daylight, ultraviolet A is present. And remember I showed you that UVA goes all the way to the dermis. It's even present in white light. So when we talk about using sunscreen, sun, sun protection, remember I even mentioned that you should have sunscreen with PA factor. It is UVA. UVA has more aging problems as opposed to the cancer, which is UVB. It penetrates through to the dermis and it can penetrate the glass and penetrate clouds. So when people say they're using tinted glasses, they're be tinted windows in their car, it's not UVA protective. It's not, you have UVA protective glasses, you will have to get it. It's not just to have it tinted. When we talk about polarized lens and wearing sunglasses, your sunglasses, even if they are polarized and better, they are improving or reducing the glare, but not any better in UVA protection. So whether you have non-polarized sunglasses or polarized sunglasses, what your polarized sunglasses are doing for you is reducing the glare of the light. You should still avoid direct sunlight as much as possible. Then more importantly, UVA will exacerbate the carcinogenic potential of ultraviolet B, which is the one that is known to cause the immediate sunburn and tanning, the one that really causes you to darken. It has a shorter wavelength. So you will see the effect because it's at the epidermis. And it's usually highest between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. So you want to avoid going out when the sun, when the sun is high, um, at that time because that's when you really have UVB at its uh, optimum. And it has the carcinogenic potential causing this uh, basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell, as well as melanoma. So generally, I think I caught the slide from somewhere, somebody uh, on the internet. When you talk about sun exposure, you want to wear a moisturizer or protective lotion that has sunscreen. Somebody had asked that sunscreen or sun cream, what are we saying? A sunscreen is something that will prevent your, your, the sun from getting to you. It's screening. It can come in form of a lotion, can come in form of a cream, can come in form of a spray. SPF is important. We've mentioned that. We've talked about avoiding the sun between 10 and 4 and apply your sunscreen. If you're swimming or you're doing your gymming or any activity that will make you sweat, you have to apply it a bit more frequently because then your protection reduces with more sweating. I have a lot of Caucasian patients in Nigeria and Lagos, and they always come in for mold checks because the story has been told to them over and over and over that your changing molds are a problem. So we need to try to um, look at our skin a little bit more. When I say we, I'm talking about the black people because you tend to think that sun damage is not affecting you, but we have photo aging. And again, with UVA potentiating the effect of UVB, you can't be too careful as much as possible. You want to avoid exposing children that are younger than six months. I remember my daughter had sun, she had a, the longest sunburn for the, she had summer for the longest of time because uh, when she was much younger in the UK, she, she, she was exposed and it just hit her on the cheek for the longest of time. I didn't try to do anything about it because I was hoping it was going to wear off. It did. She has a little bit of a fade, but it's there because it will really trap and the kids will have that problem. Wear a hat and protective clothing when you're not, uh, when you're outdoors. The redheads, those that have skin type 1, are more susceptible to uh, sun damage than um, those of skin type 4 to 6. And you should see a dermatologist if you're not sure of any skin change. So now I'm going to run through some diseases that we see in children. This is a discolored patch, a deep pigmented patch, common in children. This is vitiligo. It's common in children. For the most part, it's usually on one half of the pre-segmental. And ironically enough, this is the good part of the sun. The sun will help the color to come back. So when I talked about the good, the bad, and the ugly, this is one of the good parts of the sun. But the sun before the, that heat, that's, so early morning sun before, 10, before noon is helpful here. That's what we talk about, phototherapy. So the sun with all its drama also has some good things. This is a patient, a little boy with atopic dermatitis. This is another patient with atopic dermatitis. Dr. Dio and the pharmacist Dio mentioned AD. AD is one of those inflammatory conditions that has a familial tendency to it. It has genetic predisposition. And with the right, in the right environment, patients will flare up. They don't like heat. 
they don't like to be hot. They don't like extreme changes in temperature. They don't even like changes per se. These patients should not be dry in any form or manner. They have to be well moisturized. This is a child who is clearly suffering and the entire house is suffering with this child. You can see all of the excoriations, all of the changes because he, he has scratched himself to stupor. It's very uncomfortable. This child just needed really, for the most part, to be well moisturized and kept cool. Sometimes take off the clothing completely and let them feel better. AD has stigmata with flexural hyperpigmentation and they tend to sometimes have other atopic conditions like asthma or allergic rhinitis where they're always sneezing, like they have hay fever and then venal conjunctivitis where they're always rubbing at their eyes. Now, even though we see AD in neonates and in children, we can also see AD in adults and it will manifest differently. So this is a, a, a young adult uh, with atopic dermatitis and you see the flexural like indication. This is the lighter skin person than she. So here, if you didn't know any better, you'd be thinking these are different because she is fair. The dark skin doesn't show redness as much. It shows it as darkness. So it's like infused darkness. It's like it's so suffused. But well, it's the same thing. Uh, the cubital fossa is um, red and angry and it's a discrete patch. You can see, and then they scratch, and the scratching is so pleasant until they break the skin, then they start to cry because now they're in pain. Children, again, tend to have a lot of viral exanthem. This is a child with, um, this is a Staphylococcus caudus skin syndrome. It's already exfoliating here from staph, and this can happen when the skin breaks and you introduce um, one of the group A uh, streptococcus into the body. It's a problem. This patient has to be admitted. It starts small, and most times it is what you do that makes it worse. So when you're in doubt of a child's problem, just take the child to the, to the doctor as much as possible. This child also had a viral exanthem that parents put different things on, and it's leaving all of the scars. This is not a very clear picture, but it was a blister that came up from hand, foot, and mouth syndrome, which is common in children. You can see some other ones. And um, somebody tried to bust it initially, but we told them quite rightly that they should stop. And it will resolve by itself. More often than not, when you're in doubt, live well alone. So now compare those blisters to these sort of kind of blisters. blisters and this isn't an adult. So this is not staph, look at the staph called the skin drone. This is not uh, impetigo. This, this patient actually has skin cancer. This is an elderly man. So it looks the same, but it's not the same. And this has been impetigenized. So when you see certain things in the patient, more often than not, you're going to have to take a history to really find out what is going on. Because one skin picture may look like another person's own, but in a different age group, it's likely giving you a different diagnosis. So the skin has a limited way it responds to insults, but the story is different. You must ask the question. This is what I mean again, that the same manifestation may actually have different diagnoses across ages. So this is a child that came up with, well, she was nine actually, came up with this. And the story was that she'd had this since she was little and she, she, said, she kept picking at it. So it looks like a viral wart, but actually it's a nevus. This is a verrucous nevus. So somebody will try to pick this up and cause a bit of injury and cause a scar when there are different other ways to do it. It was completely asymptomatic, but she was picking it because she didn't like it. And she only started picking it as she was getting older. Compare that with this in a younger, this is actually a middle-aged person. This is a cancer. This is keratoecanthoma. Picked up again because somebody thought it was acne and let me squeeze this. This on the other hand looks like it, but this is lupus. Picked again. So everything may look the same. This person is younger than here. So, I mean, we're looking at a papule on the, sea, on the cheek of females, but they are different ages. What is going on beneath? Everybody will have a sort of different story. We need to find out what the story is. This is a baby. This is a child. And this is an adult. It's the same disease. It's looking very different. This is scabies. This child started and was scratching and scratching and impetigenized the lesion. You wouldn't expect so badly scabitic lesions like this, except somebody has tried to manipulate it. They put a bow on this because the child was scratching too much and he came down with a lot more of um, a lot more problems than he should have been. And this is the same thing. This is more classical where you see um, blister, uh, papules or blisters 
in the finger web spaces, sometimes they become a little bit more infective, depending on how you scratch and break the skin. And in an elderly, in the younger adults, in an adult, you see them in the axilla, well, you see that in children, as well as in the pubic region. Little, little papules, seriously pruritic, seriously pruritic, manifesting differently. Same disease manifesting. So you can have infectious disease across all ages. I'm just trying to show you even that. Dr. Riri. My time is almost up. Okay. How many minutes do I have? Please? Zero. <laughs> oh. Okay. So I'm just going to run slides through have you got? I, don't worry. I'm going to rush through them. So this right. is, this is uh, lupus. This is not rosacea. This is lupus. This person should not be attended to by the people who do not know what they're doing. They're both females and they both have rashes across the cheeks, seemingly not spreading across the nose. Somebody would think this is a fungal infection. It's not. These are cancer manifestations. These are skin manifestations of cancer. This is erythema, erythema gyratum repens, and this is a sign of uh, GI malignancy. So rashes, like Dio mentioned, will manifest slightly differently depending on one site, and sometimes it can be very, very bad. In children, it is inverse, and you see it in folds, and you don't see those heavy, heavy skills. Instead, you see like a discoloration. Is this simple dry skin? or skin cancer. So I've got to end with this case about a young girl who came into the clinic recently with itchy rash back and forth for about four years. They thought it was acne, they had managed, but the thing comes and goes. And we were looking at this and we see this, this is on the face, this is also on the limbs. Something is going on here. This is not a regular acne because the person is just a like young adult. Skin biopsy is going to reveal that this patient actually has lupus. So a quick word on hair, I'm just going to leave. It's huge business. People spend a lot of money on hair. Commonly, we have traction and alopecia. Dr. Ifama mentioned it. We say it's frontal, temporal. Seen in females, but now men are making their hair a lot and wanting to do what women are doing. So we are seeing it in men too. The problem is that our hair is different. It's very coily and it has drama. So you pull it in the way it shouldn't be pulled. It will give you drama. Can we take care of it? If you come in early, sometimes you can reverse hair growth if it has not been scarred. Like you can see, this patient is actually getting back. She's a repair. I didn't show you her first one. Pseudofolliculitis barbe, shaving, poor shaving techniques. If you shave wrongly, whatever part of the body, because we are black, we will scar. Pubic shaving, this is what happens. Keloids will form. Keloids will form. Keloids will form. Unsightly, difficult to manage. Very difficult to manage. So please shave right. Don't shave often. Shave uh, in the proper direction. Exfoliate. Use aftershave. Moisturize the screen with razor bump cream. Care for your nails. And I would ask, somebody would answer, who do you think should manage this condition? I think at the Q&A we'll take it up. So in summary, can we stop or prevent or stave off skin aging? Maybe if you eat well, take a lot of water, try and see if you can uh, acidify your water with lemon and cucumber and mint leaves. Optimal skincare, like we have all said, sun protection, do not smoke, reduce your alcohol, please no substance abuse. Antioxidants, should we have replacement therapy for ones for women so they can stave off their getting to girls men? Exercises, by all means, meditation, yoga, avoid stress if you can. Maybe you should not live in Lagos, then you will avoid stress, right? Thank you for listening to me, okay? Thank you very much. And we'll come back to that, your quiz during the Q&A, or just before it anyway. Um, like I said, we're still gonna take questions. Thank you for hanging in there. We have our last speaker before the Q&A, and her name is Joy Enaharo. She's an advanced esthetician with a passion for skin and skin health. She's a member of the British Association of Beauty Therapy and Cosmetology. She's had numerous brand tra trainings such as image skincare, mesoteric, dermatological, ele elements to mention her few. Her passion for skin, motivates her continuous education in skin and all things aesthetic. Joy is going to talk to us about what aestheticians do and what they are not supposed to do. All right, Joy, over to you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Okay, first of all, I need to like clarify what an aesthetician really is because a lot of um, the word aesthetician is used really differently in different countries. Well, I'm in the UK and I'm trained in the UK. Now, in most countries, a beauty therapy is what they call an esthetician. So that's someone you go to for 
your facials, for your body work, maybe your waxing, your nails and all that. An esthetician in the UK is someone who is trained in skin and skin health. Now, what do they do? There are people you go to who will sit you down and have a detailed consultation about your skin. Now, if you've got certain skin conditions, they can help you treat it. What they do not do is treat skin diseases. They are trained to recognize these diseases and they send you off to a doctor or a dermatologist. They do not prescribe because there are certain skin conditions that would need a prescription to bring it under control. Estheticians do not prescribe. They will send you off to your doctor or to a dermatologist for that. Now, within the scope of the aesthetic practice, they can treat certain skin conditions with limits. And that is why they call them non-medical aesthetician because there are some medical um, procedures they are allowed to do like skin blemish removal. So they can remove certain skin blemishes like milia, skin tags, um, non-viral warts. They can't deal with moles because like Dr. Rere said, it could be anything. They send you off to a dermatologist or your doctor who will refer you somewhere. Now, and um, that's it. Basically, you come to estheticians for your skin health. They, they talk you through and they help you understand why certain things are happening within your skin. They help you uh, organize a routine that would be beneficial to your own certain skin specific. An esthetician knows your skin type because you've had a detailed consultation with them. They, within the condition you have, they can prescribe certain things for you to use to deal with those skin uh, problems you have. Now, um, what else do estheticians, or what can they not do? Estheticians cannot work with certain depths of, um, like when I said to you, we can do some medical procedures with, with limits. We have the limits that we cannot go beyond certain level of the skin because Dr. Herrera told you uh, about the layers of the skin. Now, an esthetician cannot work below the epidermal dermal junction of the skin. And that is where the, um, the epidermis ends and where the dermis starts. So be, within the epidermis, we've got the five layers. We can walk all through those layers of the skin to that junction and we cannot go beyond that junction. So if you have skin conditions in which we have to do controlled skin uh, wounding to the skin, we cannot go beyond uh, uh, the uh, epidermal junction of the skin. And uh, what else can we not do? I think that's about it really. It's just generally, we can help you through your skin health issues. We can treat some certain conditions. And if there are things that we know that we cannot um, lawfully do, we send you off to a, um, a doctor or a dermatologist. Simple and short and straightforward, that is it. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. <laughs> so I hope everyone knows now what an institution does and what they cannot do. Give me some reactions with thumbs up or something to, for us to know that we know what they can and, can and what they're not supposed to do. I can't see any reactions. So that means Joy will have, I don't know if you have, that means you'll have to talk again. Oh. Okay. Every, okay. 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 Thank you, everybody. Yes. All right. I see you. I see you. Fantastic. Right. So now it's time for Q&A. And I know you've all been patiently waiting. Let We'll get to your questions. I'm just going to ask all our speakers to put on their videos so I can spotlight them. If you have a question, I'm, I'll, no, actually, I'll start with the ones in the chat because they've been waiting the longest. So let me just... Uh, What did I do? All right. Okay. So spotlight. If you have a question, just write it in chat so you don't forget. I will get to it. I just want to spotlight our speakers. All righty. I know Joe will have to go soon, but let's just get her in. Okay. So let me scroll all the way back up. Lots of questions. 
Our first one from Dr. Edore. She knows a 26 year old with recurrent shingles on his forehead. What is the best management for that? Anybody can take that. If I'm a, anybody can take it. So anybody take who is anybody say? I, I, on the panel, who else is it going to be? It's not me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, doc, shingles is a viral infection, like you rightly said. Now, so if you say louder, shingles, I can't hear you. Okay. Louder, louder. Sorry, you want me to scream? Can you hear me? Yes, that's better. I, I'm actually screaming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we can't hear you. <laughs> Okay, so shingles is a viral infection. See, shingles is um, colloquial for happy zoster. And for you to say that it's recurrent on the face, then clearly maybe um, this patient, sorry, person may have some immune competence that we have to check out because shingles is like a reactivation of childhood chicken pox, which is varicella zoster. So, the, the person needs to see the doctor because if it is recurrent, stress is likely bringing it up and chances are they would need prophylactic antiviral. That's likely what is going to happen. If we check every other thing, there is nothing that is making the patient have a recurrence of it. You check, you have to do lots of tests to be sure because that's a young person. You don't really expect to be seeing shingles in that age. You want the, it usually happens when they're older. So we need to find out what's going on. So if the diagnosis is correct, which is the important thing, then we need to find out what else is going on, okay? All right. If I'm ad do you want to add anything to that? No. <laughs> okay. There, there are so many questions. I think we should just get to them quickly. <laughs> All right, that's fine. Right, the next one is, uh, can aloe vera help with alopecia? Everybody's saying no, so don't bother. <laughs> jo jo Joy has said no. Uh, if I'm at this shake here, if I'm at this shake no, no, no. Uh, no. So no, no. All right. You, you, when you're answering, please do speak because I'm on another screen. I have to make no problem, you know, no problem. Bigger okay. to be able to see the questions. No problem. <laughs> to make it faster, right? Why do people on the African continent not need or have not thought that they needed sunscreen? I think we've answered that in the presentation. That it's a misconception. Um, but I think we've pointed out severally why they need to use sunscreen. So I think basically that question, I mean, just a misconception because they feel they have melanin and it protects the skin, but it's more than that. Whether you have black skin, whether you're Caucasian, everybody needs some protection. Area has spoken about UVA, UVB rays, UVC rays, you know, so it's more than just having black skin. It's a misconception, but I think that people are becoming more aware and educated about it. And personally, I've seen people, more and more people, black people using sunscreen. Joy had her hand up. Yeah, yeah. I, it, like um, doc, Dr. Ife said, it's um, not enough education. More than ever before, darker skin tone people need sunscreen because we got the cell within us, we have our melanocyte cells, right? And what the sun does to our melanocytes is that it triggers it and it kind of makes it produce so much. And that is the reason why we actually need more sunscreen because every scratch, every bite, every burn, it's a post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation on the skin. How do you prevent that? You need to protect the skin. We haven't been educated a lot. We've been told the story that, oh, you have melanin. Because you have melanin does not protect you from inflammation, does not protect you from PIH on the skin, the more reason why we need it. So we need to educate ourselves more. And then um, I think the people have had the myth of saying some sunscreen causes cancer on the skin. And that's why a lot, yeah, yeah, that's so, why yeah. a lot of black so, people don't use it. I mean, I've come across a lot of uh, dark skin tone people who tell me that. And that's why they don't use it. So it's the education that matters. Okay, so just quickly to add to that. So first of all, PIH, for those who don't know, is post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. So Joy had mentioned that. So I just wanted to, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. All right. So just quickly to uh, uh, clarify something. The myth, it's not a myth. There is actually scientific uh, 
debates going on about some of the ingredients in um, chemical sunscreen. So it's not really a myth per se. There is a scientific, so they're trying to disprove the notion that um, certain chemicals, the oxybenzones and some of the octroxinate, uh, octinoxate, have carcinogenic potential. And that's why some people are afraid of them. However, it's the same way you say, how much sunscreen do you need to use to actually give you protection? The problem is us. This is our problem. The whites have, the Caucasians have found out over and over again that using sunscreen, avoiding the sun, sleep, slop, sleep on cream, slap on a heart, slap on some things helps them, especially in Australia. We haven't demonstrated enough what sunscreen does. When I say we, the black Africans, you know, black African Americans, we haven't demonstrated enough. And until we do that, we'll probably keep having this drama. So we are doing that, like what Encapsulate Health is doing. So this is more education. So Joy, you're correct about the education, but we want to give scientific evidence-based about everything that we're doing, okay? So move on, please. Thank you. All right, how can we replenish collagen in the skin as we age? After showing that diagram of all the collagen doing this, please, how do we straighten it back up? <laughs> if I'm at, do you want to take that? Um, okay, Joy, Joy, go ahead. Okay, if I'm at, if I'm at work. Okay, it's about collagen, how to replenish collagen. Well, number one is prevent the collagen loss by using sunscreen. Dr. Ayray um, talked about it extensively the photoheliosis and all those. So if you prevent it, I think you're in a better place than trying to you know, treat it. Um, we have a treatment called micro um, needling, which is collagen induction therapy. It's quite popular. And um, we use that for inducing collagen. Um, I also see clients coming and showing me supplements, collagen supplements. I don't think that works so much. So I always discourage them from taking so many supplements that, that claim to replenish collagen. Um, your skincare practice, basically, in, in summary, your skincare practice, your daily skincare practice, including the um, sun protection and regular treatments would um, help you to keep up your collagen level. Joy, you want to add? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, I do want to add. My doctor, if he said, no amount of um, cream, multivitamins, or collagen tablet will build your collagen. Now, the collagen, where do we build it? It's within the cells. There's, we've got a cell called the fibroblast. That is where we produce the protein that produces collagen. And for you to produce collagen, you need to go and send your fibroblast into action. How do you do that? You need to do a controlled damage to the skin. How do you do control damage to the skin? You either do things like chemical pill, microneedling, um, um, radio frequency. Those are the things that do control damage to the skin to help the wound healing process. Because when that is in process, that is when collagen starts to build. And that is the only way you can actually build collagen, not through your creams, not through vitamins. But you can add in you can add diet. So very correct, Dr. Ifama and uh, Joy. Very correct. You want to do that when it has already been gone. Forget it. You have to do CIT, collagen uh, indu inducement therapy. But to stave it off, food. She, Dr. Uh, Joy mentioned protein. It's protein. So it's protein. It's, <laughs> it's. Let medicine be your food and let food be your medicine. It will stave it off. You remember my last slide. To stave off to forestall, to push it away. It's gonna happen because it's life. It's gonna happen. But can you stave it off? Maybe. Try and eat right. Try and improve on your protein. Collagen is protein. But when the drama has happened, when everything has fallen off, forget it. You have to, nothing else is left to help you. Very Great. Good. Gosh, no comments. Um, mm. Next question. <laughs> Are essential oils safe for the skin? Um. For what? What are you doing with the essential oil? You want to burn it? Is it for fragrance or to apply on? Some skin? people apply it. Okay. So, well, for me, contact dermatitis. You need to be very careful. You need to be very careful. Oils generally, 
when you're using oils for massage, for aromatherapy, for all the other things that you want to feel good about, because they do have, because they give off a fragrance and they have a feel good factor to them. And they help you um, do yes. that, uh, what's it called? That relaxation therapy, where you actually try to massage the skin that um, musicians do, yes. However, they are not moisturizing. They're not very good moisturizers. Oil and water, they don't mix. So for your oils to do what you think it should be doing, if you think it's giving you something, there must be some sort of moisture on the skin, a little bit of water. Otherwise, you are shining. You are shining. You're just shining. You're locked in of drying. <laughs> right. Okay. And I find that they have some factors, oils. they have some feel good factors. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and essential, I mean, I would say no, because essential oils in particular, concentrated oils, we're not even talking about regular oils, like, you know, they are concentrated. I wouldn't apply them directly mm -hmm. to the skin in, in any form. Even when you use them for massage, you kind of like put them in carriers, you know, that you use. So yes, applying it directly, I wouldn't say no, definitely not. Okay. John? I totally agree with everything everyone is saying that even with massage and all, that is why an in-depth consultation is very necessary because not all essential oils are meant for everyone. Yeah. There are some certain oils that can trigger off things in you. So you have to know, do I have high blood pressure? Do I have diabetes? Diabetes? Do I have this? Do I have that? There are some certain oils you cannot use. So that is why you actually need to seek professional advice before using any sort of oil on your body. But within the face, I personally and professionally would tell you, take the oils off the face, the, uh, the um, essential oils off the face. All righty. Um, anyone want to ask a question and they can unmute? Uh, Tammy, you had a question? Let's hear some voices. Jamie. Yes, hello, thank you. I think the first one I had was, um, apart from medicine for hormonal um, acne, is there anything else um, someone wanted to know? Is there any, any other meds or any other thing you can advise for that? And then I'll ask the second one quickly. Okay, can I just take um, adult acne, which is what we talk about hormonal acne. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I can hear you, we can hear you. All right, so adult acne, technically, we talk about adult acne when, especially for females, really, it's females that have it, when you say they have acne um, from 25 years and above, it can be persistent, it can be, um, uh, what's it called? Temporary, as in basically coming, persistent or um, coming back and forth. Usually mm -hmm. you would want to investigate what is going on. For the most part, androgens, when you talk about uh, androgenetics, so it's acne and androgen, so the hormones, for the most part, you have the androgen receptors being more sensitive, not necessarily that you have increased androgens. But if it is part of a hormonal disorder like um, PCOS, that's polycystic ovarian syndrome, then you have to manage it. And you can find these ones out with, if they have hirsutism, they have hair loss. So they have acne, but they have hair loss. In fact, I had a patient yesterday, she started to came in with acne, which she had gone through all facials and done many things, but she had hair loss and nobody ever linked those two. And then they just mm. asked a few questions. She had some dysmenorrhea. So when we say medicines, I, I'm just coming back. I just give you a baseline. When we say medicines, you have to target what the real problem is. Sometimes in managing what the hormone disorder is, you take care of the yeah, care of the background. So medicines will be in addition to whatever else that needs to be. So medicines will be given. Medicines must be given, but there might be other things that will be needed as well. So you definitely will need to see a dermatologist who will probably manage you with um, your endocrinologist or a gynecologist and a gynecologist as the case may be. Okay? okay. Oh, thank you. I'll pass I hope that helps. If, I, I mean, I was meant to someone who wanted to join and they couldn't, so they said to ask that question. So I'll pass the message on. Um, the other one I wanted to ask is this is for me. So for the um, on evil face that you said, that you said, uh, is it the pigmentation or something like that? Um, thank you for that for all the speakers. It's been very, you know, informative and educational. And like you said, it's education for a lot of black people. We don't like to use the sunscreen, sun cream, etc. We think our skin is very good for that. But I just wanted to ask. You know, you said, obviously, avoid sun, avoid all that. But if you've been not been, and it's affected <laughs> of your color for your facial, mm -hmm. 
going forward, we'll be using that, but what, is there anything else you would advise to kind of use for that kind of, because I know that my part of body, the color is kind of different from my face. And I think it's part of partly exposing to the sun, kind of not using any sun cream. Because I don't think I've ever used any sun cream, to be honest. <laughs> if, you're, if you're in London, go and see Joy. That's my address. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, I'll be like, oh, Joy. <laughs> I'll see you then, no problem. Joy, uh, if you want to say something, just unmute and say it. You're one of the panelists. I'll, I'll say the way we handle it is step by step. We start yeah. with topicals. Well, you start doing the right thing. You start using sun protection. Mm. So that would stop it. And eventually with time, Aries said something very important. The skin heals itself. Eventually with yeah. time, yeah. you know, the skin will heal itself. However, you want to treat what is already there. You can start with topicals and mm. progress to treatments like chemical pills, micro needling and all that. If the topical, if you're not satisfied with what the topicals are giving you. So I'll say progress gradually um, okay. in terms of treating it. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Joy? Okay, with the um, pigmentation, like uh, Dr. Ify said, you know, it all depends on the on the top uh, topical, so you need to see a specialist for that, really. But what I usually adv advise my client is, they need to start with a good skincare routine. What is that? You need to cleanse your body properly. You need to at least add exfoliating elements within your your routine at least once a week, because you can't get rid of the dead cell. It will not fall off on its own. You need to help it slough off. And the only way you can do that is to exfoliate it. It doesn't mean you need to use harsh exfoliation. There are so many things, so many mild exfoliations you can use. But with time, your, your skin will become even again. That's why I said they should go and see you. Because if they go get exfoliations, they exfoliate themselves. <laughs> they will take what is not right. That's if you want to see Joy... Time. You have to and, come through me. And you can Thank see me from my the, the aesthetic <laughs> clinic is in London too. <laughs> Don't worry, we'll put all put all your details in the chat. Someone was asking for all your details. Joy, <laughs> Joy and um if I'm up, please pop your info in the chat. And Erere, <laughs> if you want to get Erere, you need to go through me. She's not gonna put her details in the chat. <laughs> all right, iPhone, unmute yourself and ask your question. Everybody, keep your question short and sharp. Please, thank you. We've got loads of questions to get through. Huh. iPhone, unmute yourself and ask. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, go for it. Oh, hello. Yes. Um, thank you for this. Um, I asked a question about the essential oils. Thank you so much for um answering it. Basically, I run a skincare. Well, I'm starting a skincare line, and I use essential oils in my creams. So I just wanted to just you know confirm. I know you said that just using it straight on the skin is not good. But in terms of long term, I'm worried about my customers in terms of, you know, just long term use because I've read that essential oils are better than, you know, perfumes and um, chemical um, um, chemical smelling perfumes, basically. So I suppose just from like, you know, wanting to have a clean skincare line, you know, is is it right for me to use essential oils or is it best for me to actually just use no fragrance in my skincare line? Thank you. Panelists, 30 seconds each. So, so no. can Dio can just take it first? Let Dio, Dio the pharmacist. Dio, because um, she's talking about making a product. Dio, are you there? No. Okay, so Joy, go ahead. There's a market for everyone. I don't know what country you're in, but if you're in the UK, there is regulations for everything. As long as it's labeled in on your or on your ingredient list that you've got that on it, I see no reason why you have you can't you should take it out. Those who want it will have it because, um, as I, like I said earlier, essential oils sometimes can trigger certain conditions on the skin. So as long as it's labeled, fine. But if you want to, I, I don't really. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't believe in what people call clean skincare line. What is clean? Yeah, because everything is a chemical. So you just need, as long as it's labeled, you're fine. It doesn't really matter. I don't know what the, the doctors think. Those who no, want as long as it's labeled according to the regulations of the countries exactly. where they are. That's, you need yeah. to follow the regulation. <laughs> the end. That's All right, it. next. Um, Dr. Ereria, if I'm any contribution to that, or should I move on? Move on, please. All right. Ben, unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Okay, Ben. 
Yeah, All right, hello. Tade. Okay. All right. Yeah, go good evening. You we'll have 40 seconds. Okay, so my question is about the smoking part of what uh, you said. You are talking about the intake of our smoking actually leads to, uh, I mean, damages the skin. But I read somewhere that uh, when you take in food that you smoke, that also affects you somehow. I mean, it's similar to uh, smoking, but it's somehow lower than smoking. So I just wanted to ask, taking in a lot of uh, smoked food like meat, does that also affect your skin somehow? Okay, thank you. Very good question, Ben. Thank you for that. So the smoking I was referring to is actually the act of smoking. You get, you know, with uh, tobacco or all the other different types of smoking. And I did mention that passive smoking is also a problem, isn't it? Now you are talking about smoked foods, which have their own drama. They, they have their own drama with respect to respiratory problems, I, I mean, and other things. So it will come in terms of the nutrition. So that's nutrition part of uh, skin care, skin health. You don't want too many of all of these things because they do have um, free radicals. You, you're trying as much as possible to reduce the free radicals in the AME while you're taking them in. So smoked foods, they tell you that even suya, what we eat, have their own drama because that whole thing about smoking. My colleague, I think yesterday was here, she could have talked to that about that. So you try to discourage eating smoked things or smoking in an, in an open kiln. So barbecue and all of those things have their drama. But we were talking about smoking. The act of smoking, pursing your lips, holding on to things, ages the skin. The smoke itself, the tobacco, the nicotine, the cotinine ages the skin and it pushes out free radicals in the air for the environment so that even those who are not smoking but are near you, passive smokers, are also affected. So that's the smoking I was talking about. Okay? What about vaping? Helps. What about vaping? Hello. Vaping, the acting or the act of vaping is still... So you push your lips and you talk, remember I talked about muscle use and all the gravity and sagging and everything that is with it you know so all that is a problem all that is a problem whether you're talking e-smoking vaping the act of doing that ages your skin pushes your lips so there's a problem so you see people who have thank you ben for understanding me properly he's written it in the card great thanks ben if i'm out, any contribution mm, no Sorry. all right okay Shade next Unmute yourself, please. Yeah, hello. I'll just quickly ask this question. Um, Dr. Irori mentioned, um, what is the treatment can be, that can be used to slow down um, the appearance or the growth of DPN? I also heard it can freeze them. Yeah. And what is DPN for the benefit of everyone? Dermatosis papulosa nigrans. And the lay yeah. term is? So I would say we call them, I tell my black patients that is the uh, uh, black version of Oyibo people's freckles. Right. So those okay. tiny, tiny black, black marks that you tend to see around. So there is a genetic proposition, the genetic component to it. People, it tends to run in families. However, because that's the name, dermatosis papulosa nigans, with increased sun exposure, you tend to have a little bit more of them popping up frequently. And they are completely harmless. They're just aesthetically not pleasing. And there are some people who don't even have a problem with it. So to stave it off or to reduce how many or well, how much more you get, sun, uh, sun protection, sun avoidance, sunscreen in form of lotions, whatever, power, uh, whatever. But you can take them off. We can cryo them. You can do a cryo peel where you have liquid nitrogen or any other form of uh, cryo, cryo gas, a cryogen, to just do like a chemical peel, but now with cold gas. It it's, uh, causes necrosis and they fall off. Or you can cauterize them. We talk about electrocautery, where you can use some nice little heat thermal energy to kind of burn them off with some anesthesia. So you have a good, and it's fantastic. It's beautiful. You can do so many things with those things. So it's not a problem. We like it. I'm sure Joy and Ifama will be very happy to have you. I don't have, <laughs> I don't, I don't have a problem with it, but we can take them off very easily. Okay, and then you ensure that you use a lot more sun protection, avoid the sun so that you don't get them for me because nobody's promising you that when you take them off, they'll never come back. Yeah. Okay, nobody's promising that. All right. Okay, Joy, Ifama, anything else? Oh, she said it all. Oh, that's the only way you can take it off. Either you use heat or you use um, cryo, um, cold, cold um, freeze. Those are the two ways you can take them off or laser. Laser. Uh, yeah. And when you're done with that, you'd have um, some kind of dyschromia. Then you can do a chemical peel. What is dyschromia? 
Remember, we are not the dermatologist. Discoloration. This discoloration. discoloration. Uh -huh. Thank you. It so could just be think hyper about it. or hypo, you know, dark spots or lighter areas, you know, and you can use a chemical peel to finish that off and usually get a very good result. All right, fantastic. Thank you. Angel, on me to ask your question. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, is it necessary to use serums or toners uh when it comes to your skin routine? Okay. Did you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, we heard you. Make sure you're doing the basic ones first. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> yes, How make sure you do the basic oh, okay. ones first because this is Jara you are now doing. Okay. And there are so many serums and toners. So, yeah, so depending on the condition you're trying to treat, you can have additional steps in forms of serum. Like you can use hyaluronic acid if you have dehydrated skin, um, niacinamide if you have acne. Um, alpha abutin if you're trying to treat pigmentation. So there are many kinds of serums. So what serum are you using? Toner. Why are she you said, using? She said toner, toner. She said toner. I'm not serums and toners. toners. Okay, serums and toners. Serums and toners. I'm not a fan of toners because a lot of them have alcohol. Yeah. However, some are designed, some are actually serums in form of toners. They don't have alcohol and they're okay to use, but generally I avoid toners. I avoid toners. Joy, so, but, okay. Sorry, the important thing is what I the important is what are you trying? Why are you using the toner? Exactly. You know, why exactly. do you want to use it? For me, that's the question I need to answer. So do you okay. want to <laughs> yeah, sorry. Like Dr. If if he said, the first question I'll ask you is what's the reason why you're using a toner? Now Gone are the days. The reason why most people were using toners in the past was because they said, oh, I'm trying to balance, balance my skin's pH mm -hmm. because they say, oh, the water disrupts my skin pH. Now, moving forward, 2022, skincare has evolved. So many brands are now pH balanced. We don't need the step of toner. Toners come in different from in this age right now. You can have acid toners you can have hydrating toners you can have so what is it why are you using the toner that is the question i'll ask you is it because i want to balance my ph you don't need it if you're using the right skincare is it because i just want that light exfoliating process of using an acid toner fine yeah it's a good thing use it once in a while so why are you using your toner okay can I, uh, can I just ask one question? Can I ask one question? Yeah. Sorry to Angel. I think Angel. I think another question, what's very important to me is how, everything they've said is correct, but how are you using the toner? Some people use toners, like you put it on the cotton mm -hmm. pad and then you Yeah, this. cotton pad. That's what you mean? Yes. Okay, I will actually say a downright no. Okay. They've been very nice. If I'm and Joy have been very nice and trying to, okay... <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not I'm not that nice. No, it's a no. Let me tell you the reason why it's a no, if that is exactly what you're doing. Mm -hmm. If you notice, I don't know if you follow the presentation, I had mentioned that as much as possible, you want to be gentle with your skin and not sponge, not scrub, not do things like that. Yes. You had at some point again, where we're talking in terms of, even when we have done a procedure for you, we've cauterized a DPN and we said that you would have a post-inflammatory hypopigmentation because there'll be a rebound. Joy, I think somebody also mentioned how when you have an injury, you will have rebound pigmentation. The act of rubbing your skin is an injury of a sort. It's a mechanical form of injury. The act of rubbing your skin. And you will find that most people think that when they use toners and they do this and they see some brownish, they say, oh, it's not yet clean. You do more again. Oh, it's not yet clean. You do more again. It's a no-no. So you don't realize that you are actually destroying your skin and you will have rebound pigmentation because your skin wants to repair what it thinks you destroyed, not on purpose. I don't know if that makes some sense to you. Yes, it does. Yeah. Good. So the thing about this thing, if you see my slide when I talked about big money spinner in the market, I'm, I'm going to put my new money product and all of you will buy. <laughs> because the point is they're using the same things and they're just making money off you. Okay. Oh, do this, do this. Do this. And it's such a headache. Oh, should I have done one before two, before three, before four? No. 
simple, okay? As much as you can possibly do it, simple. Please, oh, anybody who is, wants me to be brand ambassador, I didn't say it. I will change my story when you pay me. <laughs> Thank you. Next question. <laughs> Moving on quickly. All right, then. Dr. Salisu, what is, your, what is your view on the scientific study that reported that people with acne tend to have younger looking skin as they grow older? Does that mean slowing down aging? Have you, is that something that you are aware of? Hannah? I'm assuming it's directed at me. Is it me or if I'm not somebody? Anybody that wants to answer on the panel. Well, What's I your view on the, on the scientific I've study? Heard that... of, I haven't come across it. it. However, I'd say that generally people with oily skin tend to look younger for longer. So you'd find that someone with acne probably had oily skin. And as it gets older, what, I mean, it's something that I've seen that if you have oily skin, you tend to wrinkle less. And so there's that concept of their aging slower. That, that's what I know about it. I've not seen any particular study. Well, we're, assuming that. that's, we're assuming that's what the, that's why I said I haven't come across a study. But again, yes, when you are interpreting studies, you, you try as much as possible to take it fully and not just take maybe just one aspect yeah. of it. So there may be more to that study as opposed to just this uh, synopsis that you've given. But I can't speak to what I don't know. Okay. But All Ifoma right. has a point in what she said in terms of sebaceous gland activity, mm -hmm. hyperactivity of the sebaceous gland will give you acne. And meanwhile, that oiliness that people are looking to remove is actually very good. It's actually very good. That's the truth. You know, it keeps your skin supple and it keeps it healthier and younger looking. So maybe that's what they mean, but we don't know. I haven't come across the study. All right. Okay. Uche, oh, you had a question in the chat. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask it? I'm asking you to unmute Uche O. Oh. It's raining. Okay. Um, I'll ask it then. Sometimes skincare products, food, vitamins don't do much even after you've done your blood works and you're good internally. Besides food and vitamins, what else can be ingested for hormonal balancing? We've talked about collagen, vitamin C, or even hyperpigmentation. There is so much in the media today. Are these safe? Should I read it again or it's clear? That's the question. Sorry, I didn't hear it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, not sure. I'm not sure I understand. So she's trying I mean, to say, I... apart from. So she's trying to say that, okay. Anything else? The skin, yeah, everything is not working. The food, apparently, the food is not working. Vitamins don't do much. Even after they check their blood works and everything is good internally. And I'm assuming she's saying. If they're healthier or, or you know then you need to see your esthetician to help you devise a good skincare routine because you might be using the wrong products you might be doing taking care of your skin the wrong way uh your lifestyle might have to come into play because your blood works is okay but there could be certain things within your lifestyle that is also causing your skin to go not the right way so you need to see a professional to help you sort that out really a skincare professional okay next one can we use salt and tepid water to treat i think this is athlete's foot they're trying to ask salt and tepid water to treat athlete's foot anyone want to take wait, that wait where is dio <laughs> dio took athlete's foot where is he <laughs> I don't know. All right. Gone. So when we when we when we talk salt and tepid water, basically, uh, Dio, you're here. Okay. So Dio, please take your question. <laughs> Did you, you're on mute, Dio? If I heard you right, the question is if uh, salt water can uh, treat athlete food. Is that the yeah, question? Uh, yep. Yeah. Well, maybe because um, fungi and bacteria do not thrive well uh, in, uh, in salt water, it's possible that uh, such can inhibit the, the growth of, of, of uh, fungi infection and the feedbacks. I don't have any scientific uh, backing to that, but it's possible because of the concentration of the, the salt. 
Yes, but what should they be using to treat it? I think you mentioned they can it, use topical. To they can it. use topical. Um, doctors can prescribe uh, topical antifungal uh, medications, or they can also use uh, oral antifungal medication, just like I stated in my presentation. But the dermatologists, of course, they are experts and they will know the right uh, topical or creams to to prescribe in such a case. Okay, so anyone else want to add to that? Salt. You said? Okay. Thank you, Dayo. Let me so instead you. of using salt, they should they should go with, with the normal antifungal medications that we have. Great. Exactly. Thank you. Anyone else want to add to that? Okay, just to say that, uh, thank you, Dio. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Dio. Thank you for that. So this, the question was, can we use salt and tepid water to treat? The answer is no. Salt and tepid water will not treat a fungal infection. It won't treat. If you know why you have athlete food, then you can mitigate against it. Okay, when you think in terms of, just like Dio had mentioned in his presentation, when you walk barefoot, maybe you are wearing, you're, you're doing exercise and you're not drying out your food to wear properly. You're, you know, those sort of things. The moist environment is fantastic for the fungus to thrive. So as much as possible, you want to avoid the lifestyle that is predisposing you to recurrent athlete food. Salt water, saline as it were, is very good for cleansing generally. Generally for cleansing area because it's mimicking physiologic that's your body's fluids what we call physiologic saline that salt water by the way i have to be very careful and put it in parentheses because how much salt are you putting in how much water to actually give you saline you can have a hypertonic a concentrated salt water and you say oh dr Eri and dio said that we should use salt water <laughs> uh, so uh, the answer simple straightforward issues actually let's just say no Rinse yeah. with simple water rinse with simple water except you have proper saline that you want to use to cleanse off an area that is very moist and mushy, which you must keep dry afterwards, then use the antifungals that have been prescribed for you. By all means, you need to see a doctor. So I think the straightforward answer to your question would be a no. Okay. All right. So uh, I think a few people have asked that. What, what's the effect of using soap to wash your with the face? Some say to avoid it. And I, there was another question about, you know, what do you consider mild soap? So that's one. I just, I'm going to throw these three questions at you. What can you use for children with dark spots on the leg? And is vitiligo treatable? And can damaged skin affect one's mental health? Mm -hmm. Anyone you want to take, go for it. Well, let me take soap. <laughs> no, you shouldn't use soap on your face because it will dry out your skin. <clears throat> Remember, you're trying to keep your skin supple and hydrated. And soap is soap because it contains um, sodium hydroxide, which dries out your skin. The pH, um, the high pH is not good for your skin. Your skin should be at a certain pH. So no to the use of soap. And I don't know what you mean by mild soap, but um, generally avoid soaps and use a mild cleanser. Like what? pH. To name a brand. Don't name any brand though. Ah. Hmm. I okay, don't name any brand. Okay. You know, I had mentioned synthetic detergents. We call them syndets. In fact, I think the, 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 the rule of the thumb will be that if you are washing your face and it's really foaming, it's a no-go. If it's really foaming. So when we talk about mild cleansers, they almost feel as if they're like oiliness, as if, are you really washing me? You know, just, do you understand? When yeah. we talk in terms of that's what we're talking about. There, there is a soap or two that will come to mind where you've used it to wash and it feels like you haven't quite rinsed off your face. I'm just not going to call the brand name. But what she said about hydrating cleansers, mild cleansers, some people will tell you gentle, gentle foaming cleansers, they are getting ready to be soap, but not quite <laughs> there. Uh -huh. So I don't know. All we're right. not calling any brand names, no. Cool. What? Okay, so vitiligo, is it treatable? And then uh, can damaged skin affect one's mental health? The answer is yes, but yes. How the damaged skin affect your mental health? The reason why the aesthetic market is growing so rapidly is because of that issue. A lot of people get so depressed. They get so worried, you know, with the state of having a really bad skin. 
so it, it does affect a lot of people's mental health because some people are too shy to wear their face clean without makeup they're too shy to you know go out because they feel oh my days my skin is not perfect enough so it does affect people's mental health and that's why um product companies are making in fact the beauty industry is making so much money because of that all right okay thank you guys for that um somebody asked is there specialized treatment for exogenous ochronosis you have to go through steps okay eo is not something so eo is short for exogenous ochronosis it's not something that and if the person who has eo would know that it didn't come overnight so the time it takes for exogenous ochronosis to build up because the problem you're seeing is actually not epidermal it's deeper Mm -hmm. So you're not about to do something topically to get it off. Chances are, if anybody offers you that, they're going to damage your top skin and have even deeper problems. So it takes steps. So I would say whoever has exogenous ochronosis, assuming it is exogenous ochronosis, you know, one thing about the skin, and why we have to be very careful. What you see looks like what somebody else's cells should. But when you come to the people who can speak skinnies, I always talk about skinnies, which is the language of skin that we speak. I can't tell. I'm, I'm going to tell myself. You have to hear the story because the fact that I have a discoloration or a slight redness does not make it EO. Somebody needs to check you out and hear the story because for all you care, it might be rosacea that has been disturbed. What is your diagnosis? Go to see the people who actually have been trained and then they will give you some form of regimen, okay? It takes time. EO on its own is not going to go just like that. It will take time and you take a combination of therapies, oral, topical, and procedural. You might need to do laser or two sessions. You might need to do chemical pills. You might need to take oral medication. You might need to take some topical medication as well, okay? Can I quickly answer the question on vitiligo? Yeah. The, the, the story about vitiligo, so Joy spoke about it when she said, when she was talking about mental health. Skin, health, mental health. I started with saying it's a big, big money spinner now because social media skin tells you you can have what they consider fantastic skin. And so you are striving. You, the person that is on that social media, is striving to be what they've told you to be. So of course, you're going to spend a lot of money on it. And when it doesn't happen, you are depressed, you're downcast, and you don't want to show your face. You don't want to be friends with anybody. You are only alive on social media because you are filtering everything that you see. So yes, there is mental health problems with skin problem. Vitiligo is an issue that you're not born with. We don't know why it happens. It's a combination of things. Now, if it come, if you come in early, sometimes, if it's not burnt out, we may be able to manage it. But I cannot tell you that as we speak today, science has found a cure for vitiligo. No. There are very, very recent findings about certain medication, the biologics that are ongoing. Some of them have even passed phase three clinical trials. I don't want to call any name here. And it is helping, but the jury is still out. Okay. Thank you, Olabodi Daramola. Flawless skin eh, <laughs> can be achieved with all your money. Then you will not be hungry and you will not use nutrition to help. Uh, it was actually a, a lab body that asked this question about it. Like, okay, all right, sorry, great. Not. Thank you. Next question. What is the best management for dandruff? So this is a question from Jai Ola Adeyemi. What is the best management for dandruff that is recurring since childhood and still occurring in adulthood, even after having their hair cut? Recurrent dandruff, management of recurrent dandruff. Okay, so dandruff, scaly scalp, AKA seboric dermatitis, scalp seboric dermatitis, okay? Um, it can be quite a bit of a challenge if it is dandruff. One has to be sure that we're not dealing with scalp psoriasis thinking that it is dandruff. So again, making a proper diagnosis is very important. Now, if it is seboric dermatitis, it's all part of the physiology because it is increased sebum production. So what we do is control Curing, uh, it's a bit of a tall order, but we can control it with good hair care practices, good washing techniques, right products to use, and, and trying to avoid um, 
harsh things. You know, a lot of people are going to do go the extreme. Some people will go to the thing that their hair stylists gave them a concussion that had Indian hemp and things and be using it. Product build up is also sometimes being taken as dandruff. So you have to think about all of those things put in place. Okay. But for the most part, an antifungal shampoo that has inflammatory, anti inflammatory properties. Okay. And even some anti inflammatory scalp lotion because seborrheic dermatitis is inflammation of the skin due to seborrhea, increased seborrhea. So you want to use an anti inflammatory agent as well as some antifungal because there is a fungal component to it. All. Okay. I hope and that anti inflammatory helps. means what in layman's term, please? Uh, response of the skin to insult. I think the simplest way I can put it is the response of. So inflammatory inflammation is uh, an insult, okay? And when it's when the body is trying to respond to that influ, in, insult, you can have redness, which we call rubor. You can have color, which we call heat. We can have dolor, which is like pain. We can have swelling, which is tumor, and then the loss of function. So the thing that should have been working properly with inflammation doesn't work as it should have. So that's inflammation in the nutshell. Depending on what part of the body that has the inflammation, you have sort of different responses, okay? All right, anyone want to add to that? Or the vitiligo, anything else before the next question? Oh, I should go ahead. Please be audible, I can't see you. I'm looking at the questions. I go ahead. Dr. Rere said it all, please go ahead. Great. Well, what's the best way to handle postnatal stretch marks or let me read it exactly the way the person wrote it what is the best way to handle postnatal belly stretch marks <laughs> well postnatal how 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 far postnatal are you moisturize your skin properly and if it's still causing problems you've got um micro needling it helps with stretch marks in short, see a, see a professional, see Joy or Ifama. <laughs> Next question, is it advisable to use sun protection when you're at home? Ifama, you're muted. Oh, okay. No, sorry. Okay, I said yes, unless you live in a cave. <laughs> as long as there are windows in your house, yes, please. Yeah, and the rates are coming in, you need protection because uh, most of us think it's the heat of the sun. Sometimes when the heat is not even there, the ray is what goes, like uh, Dr. Rere gave you, the, gave you the chat earlier on, is the UVA, that's what causes the aging, that's what goes deeper into the skin. So as long as your windows are open and the rays can come in, you need to protect your skin. Um, Dr. Rere, what do you think about um, computer screen and the rays from the computer screen and the uh, and the use of SPF as protection. You agree with that, right? So, so that's the thing. If you remember in my presentation, I actually even mentioned white light in the house. White light, yes. yes. The LED. The LED. So, the, yeah. we are we are finding out more and more. More that, about. In fact, right now we are wondering that do we need protection against visible lights, as in, you know UVC. So everything is there. One has to be very careful not to become a product junkie and not to live because big pharma is out there to make a killing. So whatever they churn out, we tend to want to be. So we who are clinical researchers, as well as, uh, you know, we, we have to be, we have to tease out the wheat from the shaft. So this question about computer rays and all of that, I mean, talk about anti-glare gla and this thing, put everything there. Is this happening? Is that not happening? I talked about having an umbrella that is UV protected. That's merchandise. So, so many things are out there to take your money from you. But we need to be careful not to tell the public what we haven't scientifically verified. So the information is out there, but I cannot tell you now what study or two would have actually told us a yay or nay. But there is that. There is that. So we would have to measure melameter and see, did this happen? How much time did you spend on your screen? Now the whole world is going virtual. You are permanently on one Zoom webinar or the other. We have to consider these sort of things, okay? Wow. So basically just get up and put some screen on. Yep. After your routine. <laughs> yep. And reapply. And, and reapply, thank you, reapply. All right, so what about, I don't know if we, we answered this earlier on. Um, 
creams that have S, you know, SPF built in. Did we say yes or no? Joy, you want to take that? For me, it depends on, on the factor of the SPF built into your skin, uh, skin your cream, right. because in all fairness, you know, technology is improved. Now, is it a cream with SPF 15? I would say it would not do anything. If your, your, your face cream is SPF 30 moisturizer, oh, by all means, yeah, use that because there are moisturizers now that are SPF moisturizers and most times people prefer to use that rather than put on a, a face cream and then put on the, the SPF it, it it all works it's I mean it's been proven to to work so it all depends on what's the factor in that cream what's the SPF factor in that cream so what if you have skin conditions like eczema or you know just dry skin and you're using products like you know just an emollient cream you're not using the regular creams as it were so what can so you just get a regular SPF cream and add it on top, or would what you mix I, it with the what cream? What I normally advise is that during the day, get a good moisturizing SPF cream and use it at night. Use your emollient if your eczema, you know, flares up that it, it bothers you, it itches and all that. Then you use it at night, but during the day you can find an SPF cream that it's quite uh, moisturizing and hydrating enough, but maybe the dermatologist will disagree, but I, that was what I would advise really. Okay, so can I just add, let me just add to, let me just um, highlight that. No, patients with atopic dermatitis, AD or atopic eczema, trust me, they need to adequately moisturize. I do not think that there will be SPF 50, on its own, that would do enough because they actually have to even reapply their moisturizer. I showed you the pictures of some babies who are completely out of sorts. And the parents don't realize that. They think it's just to moisturize them morning and evening. Anybody, any dermatologist will tell you that the go and the, the be all and end all of managing atopic eczema is to moisturize frequently, to damp skin preferably. So if you have that if your um, emollient has SPF all well and good, if it doesn't, reapply and put your sunscreen on. But you see, for the most part, you are looking, remember I mentioned that we're talking sun protection. It's not just to put on sunscreen, sun protection, sun avoidance. And I had mentioned that you should even wear covered clothing. So if you are well moisturized and you've covered most areas, then it is the parts that are exposed that you need to keep on applying your sunscreen to if you're out in the sun. So if you've done, so it's like a process as opposed to just a one-stop shop, this sun protection we're talking about. Avoid the sun between 10 and 4 p.m. Avoid going out with uh, exposed clothing and all the parts, but you tan, you easily tan. Your UVB, you're gonna have a burn immediately. Your UVA, it's causing you to have solar elastosis. And then wear covered clothing, wear like a wide brim hat. So all measures put together so that you're not feeling the murkiness of constantly applying a moisturizer if it is uncomfortable so that's oh, that's what i'm just going to add to that okay okay what is the place of regular facials in maintaining facial skin health okay i'll take that Re regular facial is great for your skin health because the professional when you go for your appointment the professional there would be able to um properly analyze your skin. Now, when I say, and I don't know if you go for a facial with a beauty therapist, it's a different thing from going for a facial with an esthetician. Now, if you go for a facial with an esthetician, the esthetician on every appointment does a good thorough skin analysis. There are so many things we cannot see with our naked eyes. I can look at your skin, but there are things going on under your skin. Now I have to look under your skin with things that has been, you know, manufactured for us to see beneath within your, your, your uh, skin and see what's going on. So when you go for regular facial, your esthetician will be able to direct or move your facials to things that they feel your skin needs at that time. And that is how you're going to build a, a good skin health. Because you might come to me today for a facial and the condition going on on your skin, maybe the, for this appointment, your skin is a bit 
uh, dehydrated, your skin is um, having a bit of uh, hyperpigmentation going on. We can deal with that, you know? And then you can come another time. Now we find that, that you're having breakouts, you're having, so a good regular facial just helps, you know, keep your skin well monitored and keeps that skin well balanced helping you maintain a good skin pH because what really makes our skin fall off is when we fall off the pH scale of the skin because that's how our skin remains uh, healthy. Our skin is based on, on our community and acidity. So once it falls off, once of too far of each scale, the skin just goes whack. So a good regular facial will make sure, your esthetician will make sure whatever it is you're using at that time makes you balance up that's for you, not for your skin to go well. Okay, so then, how, so how frequently should you be having facials? I usually tell people every four to six weeks. Every four to six weeks? Mm -hmm. Usually, ideally four weeks, but I mean, most people, when you tell them four weeks, you know, they just give you the nose, but ideally do not go past six weeks. <laughs> okay. Wow, that was amazing. Any last, we have time for one more last, the very last question. Who wants to ask the very last question? Just raise your hand if you have any more questions. I've gone through all the ones in the chat. Okay. If there's no more, I will say thank you all very much. Please, please, please do take time. Oh, that somebody. I knew that would happen. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Sorry. Um, good evening. Yes. This I I need I needed to ask this question because uh, I wrote it on the chat box, but it wasn't. Maybe it was omitted. How do we get to handle black spots on children's leg? I mean, should we just leave them? Maybe as a result of mosquito bites or something, and they're just there. Or should we use Ori? You know, Ori. She bought her. What do we really use? I mean, for them. Thank you. Who wants to take that? Can Buki ask a question? So we just take the two together. All right. Okay. Go on, Buki. So last question from Buki. Unmute yourself, oh, Buki. Sorry. sorry. I don't know if my question was already asked because um, I was driving. Um, I wanted to know, like, um, is micro leaving safe for um, acne prone skin? And then I wanted to know are dim, um, the dim supplements, are they um, also good for hormonal acne? If you've got active acne, I would say no. Do not do micro needling. You've got to deal with the cause of the acne first. So for micro needling, no. What is DIM supplement? I was, I I was, was going to ask myself. I was going to so ask as well. Too. Book, you unmute yourself. What, what are DIM supplements? Uh, okay, so I'm not really sure. I, I saw there's an esthetician that I follow and she recommends, it's like DIM. Uh, I don't know exactly what it is. I'm not really like as familiar. It's, it's some kind of... Um, I don't know, it's some kind of byproduct that's produced when you eat certain things, but you know, I don't know, like vegetables, it, 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 yeah, vegetables or something hormones. like that. Yeah, so it, yeah, and it's to supposed to hormones. balance the hormones or something like that, yeah. Okay, so well, science, is, I don't know about the science on that. So generally, hormone, hormone replacement therapy and all of those things, one, one has to be a little bit wary because uh, it could go either way. So I can't speak for that. I'm sorry. I don't know if anybody else can, but I can't speak for I can't speak to that or for that. So that's what. But to answer the question about um, dark spots on children's legs, uh, so if I'm correct, it will be not just on the legs, probably on the arms as well. That's the forearms. So we're talking about exposed parts of the skin, the arms and the limbs, uh, the legs, which will be. Uh, a sign of what we call papillar urticaria. So the dark spots are a result of, again, the child has scratched what is an allergic response to most likely uh, mites. Not, mosquitoes won't 
elicit allergic response. It's usually like a mite, sandfly. And because of that scratching, you will have rebound pigmentation, just like we have mentioned recurrently over the presentation. So you could, in effect, leave it and just keep moisturizing, and over time the skin will correct. But we, because we talk, we try as much as possible not to just to collect, correct skin color when they're in spots, because chances of you overcorrecting is high, and then you now have that this pigmentation or dyschromia that you're also trying to avoid. So more often than not, if you leave it be and you prevent the skin from being beaten, so cover exposed skin, use insect repellent, especially during the daytime, not at night, because you said something thinking it's mosquito. Usually it's not mosquito bite. It's usually a mite that the child has had an allergic response to. So I'm hoping that helps you. Does that does that answer the question? Yeah, he's done the clapping emoji. So yeah. Yes, it does. Thank you. Awesome. And that's our last question for tonight. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you for engaging. You've all been amazing. Um, please do feed, uh, complete the feedback form for us. Can we um, all unmute and just give it up for our speakers? I'll let everybody unmute. All right, everybody can unmute. Give it up for our speakers. Excellent, excellent, excellent.